is, for example, a farm. And I visited Jamaica several years ago. And of course, when we went on that farm, we needed a guide. We needed a tour guide. And so it's important that when we're traveling, traveling or making a decision to go someplace, we usually seek instruction, seek instructions, or we try to find a tour guide to help us figure out the best way or the right way to do it. Because we don't want to miss anything, right? When thanking the Lord for a word for you this morning, he gave me the word guidance. And I am sure we all understand the meaning of the word as we are all intellectuals, right? You don't have to agree with me. <laughs> we also know that the word guidance comes from the word guide. And in the book of Isaiah 58, 11, 8, it reads, and the Lord shall guide thee continually. The business that you are in, and that is working with people, you need daily guidance. And John 16, 13 reads, when the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truths. So you are never alone. Honorable Madam President and your members, have a job to do, a tremendous responsibility, and you really need God's guidance and direction. And Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6 read, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. It is my prayer that as you ask for his guidance, it will be given to you in every decision that you make. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we give you thanks for this beautiful day that you have allowed us to be a part of. We thank you, Father God, that we are all clothed in our right minds. Heavenly Father, you know and you see the task that is set before your servants. I pray that you would give our president and the members of this body guidance that is needed to get the job done. Help them to take seriously the matter set before them as it will affect the lives of our brothers and sisters. Everyone is important as the ground at the cross is level. We ask for your guidance on them this day. In the name of Jesus we pray and who taught us to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Good morning, and have a blessed day. Senators, we suspended yesterday for the fifth part debate, and Senator Dawson has been recognized. So we will go correctly into our continuation of the debate, as many. I said it. <laughs> hey, want me out, too? Madam President, I stand here today honored to be able to address the Appropriation Revenue Account Expenses 2020-2021 Bill, or what we normally call the Budget of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. I wish to thank God for allowing me to be placed in such a place at such a time. I also wish to thank the leader of the Free National Movement, the Prime Minister, the Most Honorable Dr. Hubert Minnis, for appointing me as one of the consultative senators and ensuring that labor, the most important commodity in our country, has a voice at the table. 
Of course, I would not be standing here today if it was not for my family and their support. I stand here today on the shoulders of my heroes, my grandfather, Prince Ferguson, my mother, Mary Eugene Ferguson, Blyden, who are both proud products of Black Point Exuma, my father, Edward Ned Isaacs, and his youngest brother, the Honorable George, Kendall George Lamont Isaacs, former leader of the FNM, who was my role model and my father as well. My sisters, Marilyn, Judy, Alma, Julia, who's deceased, Margaret, my brothers, Godwin, deceased, Charles, Edward, and Sydney, Andrew, and Tony Coakley. My oldest nephew, who's like my brother, Sean Blyden, and of course, the apple of my eye is my only son, James Clark, my daughter-in-law, Chanel Wilson Clark, and my three incredible grandsons, Shamero, Justice, and Jacob, whom I love dearly. Madam President, I also wish to convey my heartfelt condolences to the family of the late Leonard Boston Blackie Miller, a Bahamian national icon who was passed. <laughs> Boston, as his friends called him, was a renowned boxer, cyclist, educator, and coach. He was a heavyweight champion of the Bahamas, and many would remember his exciting boxing matches at the Zanzibar and Nassau Stadium, and looking forward to him delivering his famous polo punch. Sure, Dwight could remember that. Madam President, I did not just know Boston, but I had the pleasure to actually work with him. I clearly remember the day I was transferred to C.C. Sweeting High School as a new head of department and met the physical education teachers who, of course, were all older than I was. But Boston stood out as someone who was not afraid to speak his mind, loved to tell jokes, always willing to learn, give advice, and was the consummate team player. That was our Boston, a kind, dependable soul despite his hard, rough exterior. He was a disciplinarian of the highest order who shaped and molded many students' lives, not only through boxing, but volleyball, softball, track and field, and other sports that he coached. Boston was so revered that I remember at the time when we still used to discipline students and they would go home and tell their parents that Boston gave them a spiky <laughs> and the parents would come to the school and when they see it was Boston, it was like, why didn't tell me this was Boston? You know, because they'll go over and say it's Mr. Miller. And of course, they, tell, they then gave him carte blanche <laughs> to do that. And that was the kind of respect that Boston had in our community. He was also an influential figure on many Olympic teams as coach and medical trainer. Boston taught me so much as a person, a teacher, and an athlete. Julie Wilson, who also taught with us, who has gone back to England, who lived in the Bahamas for many, many years, and I were talking on WhatsApp about him. His antics, his jokes, along with his body movements, Boston was truly colorful and full of life. Her and her husband were reminiscing on how much he taught them about the human culture and the people when they first came to the Bahamas. Boston was a national, a Bahamian national hero who has never been truly recognized for what he has done for this country locally, regionally, and internationally. He is an icon that I will forever miss and remember in all that I do in my life. Leonard Boston Black. A true behemoth icon and a hero. We love you. And you deserve all of your accolades and more. May your soul rest in peace. <clears throat> I also wish to convey condolences. <clears throat> the family of Dr. Patrick Roberts, whom I got to know very well as a student nurse and a registered nurse at the Princess Margaret Hospital. Dr. Roberts was always helpful, jovial, and an excellent pediatrician that many would take their children to. I also wish to extend 
Condolences to the families of all who have died from COVID-19. May all their souls rest in peace and rise in glory. Madam President, <clears throat> I extend congratulations to all of the 2020 graduates of our primary and high schools, the University of the Bahamas, Bahamas Baptist College, and other universities locally, regionally, and internationally. You will always remember your graduation as it happened during the historic COVID-19 pandemic, which is forever etched in history. I wish to extend congratulations to my grandson, Justice Clark, who's graduating from St. Francis Joseph actually this morning in a drive through graduation that they're having. <laughs> my grandnephew, Trent Thompson, graduating from Kingsway, and both of them, of course, graduating with honors. My grandniece, Tasia Isaacs, who is graduating from SAC. All of the graduates from the University of the Bahamas, but in particular, the graduates of the Bachelor of Law LLB program, and in particular, the first part-time cohort to do so, of which I am a part. And those comrades, when we first started this program, it was about 25 of us. Uh, we're now graduating and there's only five of us left. <laughs> so that can tell you how rigorous the program is. And I just wish to talk about my colleagues who we had to encourage each other. Del Monroe, who works in the AG's office. Christina Saunders, Betty Wilson, Janae Lowe, and of course, as I said, myself. We did it. I wish to also congratulate the youngest member of parliament, the Honorable Travis Robinson, who will be graduating from the University of the Bahamas as well, with a Bachelor of Science degree in Tourism Management. He has set the standard for others to follow by being the first in his family to attain a university degree. <laughs> Madam President, I now turn my attention to the 2021 budget. And it's during times like such as these, I think of Charles Dickens' book, A Tale of Two Cities, where in the opening paragraph he states, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness, it was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity, it was the season of light, it was the season of darkness, it was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. And I remember that book so vividly because, of course, we had to do English literature in high school. So I went to Aaron Bailey and I remember that because English literature was actually one of my passions. Madam President, yes, from 1842, Charles Dickens in his, this classic text was implying an age of extreme opposites happening across the English Channel in France and the United Kingdom, respectively. It tells a story if you read it, of differences and similarities between London and Paris during the French Revolution. It goes even further to demonstrate to us, even today, that we will have disputes, that we will battle with darkness and light, evil and good, oppression and hatred, folly and wisdom, and the greatest virtue, love. He further reminds humanity that human despair cannot compare to human prosperity and of the war between the rich and the poor and the fact that we all have experienced, experienced some form of despair, suffering, joy, and hope. Yes, Bahamas, when we really think about it, we have seen the best of times and the worst of times. And it is up to each of us to decide which times come next. The Bahamas has been through, Madam President, catastrophic hurricanes, ranging from category five, three, four. And over the years, the hurricanes we all know have gotten worse due to climate change. And we see this manifested by the 2019 category five, Hurricane Dorian, called the worst natural disaster in the Bahamas history. The world, the indigenous population of the Bahamas and Bahamians today would have lived through various plagues, yellow fever, 
smallpox, the flu pandemic, polio, the influenza pandemic, the Spanish flu, the Asian flu, AIDS, H1N1, swine flu pandemic, West African Ebola epidemic, Zika virus epidemic, and now today we have the Corona-19 virus pandemic in 2020. So viruses and epidemics and pandemics has been with us for a long time in the world, Bahamas. Corona, just as its predecessors, has turned the world upside down, including our beloved Bahamas. The International Labor Organization, or the ILO, said that more than six young people have stopped working since the onset of COVID-19 pandemic. While those who remain employed have seen their working hours cut by 23%. Guy Ryder, the ILO's Director General, persisted that COVID-19 economic crisis is hitting young people, especially women, harder and faster than any other group. On the 13th of May, 2020, in Port of Spain, according to the latest data from the International Labor Organization there, 9.9% of working hours in the Caribbean are expected to be lost during the second quarter due to the impact of COVID-19. The magnitude is equivalent to a loss of 1.5 million full-time jobs. Madam President, again, the ILO Director General Guy Ryder states that the coronavirus pandemic is not just a medical crisis, but a social and economic one too. And if our response is to be effective, it must take into account all these factors and be delivered in a coordinated global way. In particular, it must answer the needs of the most vulnerable. Antonio Guterres, UN Secretary General, said the world of work cannot and should not look the same after this crisis. It is time for a coordinated global, regional, and national effort to create decent work for all as the foundation of a green, inclusive, and resilient recovery. The world of work, Madam President, that we know today has changed. We'll continue to change and evolve, and we must change and evolve with it or we will get left behind. The ILO and many organizations have been holding seminars and workshops dealing with the future of work prior to 2020 that has addressed where we are today, actually. Madam President, this is the time we're living in, right here, right now, and we must rise to the occasion and adapt to this new world of work. Madam President, this unprecedented, extraordinary, unique budget is called from crisis to opportunity and has five aims. Protecting health, the health and safety of the inmates, provide adequate social support to vulnerable members of the community, stabilizing the domestic economy, sustaining employment, and accelerating our government reforms. This budget meets the needs of the vulnerable and behemoth medical, social, and economic needs. And you heard what I said that Guy, quote, Guy Ryder quoted, actually this budget is designed to meet the things that he talked about. Two critical events have greatly impacted the Bahamas, Madam President. Hurricane Dorian in 2019, and now COVID-19 pandemic in 2020. Before these two critical events, the government was focused over the last three years on economic growth, bringing down the deficit, and had a plan to deal with our debt. The Ministry of Finance produced quarterly budget performance reports for all to see, and also engaged the public more about the budget 
by making information more accessible and easy to understand by all Bahamians. These two phenomena, Dorian and COVID-19, has hit the Bahamas economy so hard, as well as other Caribbean countries, that we compare this time to when the Second World War began, and is forcing us to have a shift in our thinking as a country. The harsh reality, Bahamians, is that our export sector has been suppressed, the domestic economy has shut down, and our economic growth has literally slowed down. This budget has had to focus its attention on what Bahamians need during this time. It's a budget for the people as 140 million has been allocated to deal with the effects of COVID-19. Namely, to assist with unemployment assistance, support employee retention with giving companies tax credits, giving small businesses continu continuity grants and loans, giving more funding to the public health sector to deal with COVID-19 from preparation to where we are now today, giving subventions to BPL and water and sewage for waiver of bills to those impacted by COVID-19. Madam President, the Deputy Prime Minister, the Honorable Peter Turnquist, said in his budget speech on June 8, 2020, that the government had two choices. We could reduce public spending and shrink the economy even further, or we could invest in public health, economic and social relief measures to mitigate the impact of the pandemic and ensure the viability of our key economic base for the recovery. These two choices, Madam President, are not unique to the Bahamas, as governments around the world are facing the same decisions that we are facing. And most prudent governments are making appropriate shifts to providing economic relief and expanded social welfare spending, even though these temporary measures will cause some deterioration to their fiscal positions. The Deputy Prime Minister further reported that the Small Business Development Center has approved nearly 40 million in funding across its programs, with just short of 6 million approved for hurricane-impacted businesses specifically, and another 29 million for those impacted by COVID-19. Definitely, we are meeting the needs of our economy, our social needs, and of course, meeting the needs of the vulnerable. Further, the Small Business Development Center has disbursed close to 20 million in funding, of which 3.4 million assisted businesses in Abaco and the Grand Bahama after Hurricane Durian, and 10.4 million to businesses affected by the virus. For those businesses seeking advisory and funding outside of the hurricane and COVID-19 programs, some 2.8 million has been dispersed. Madam President, the boring debate was very interesting to hear. However, as I listened to Minister D'Aguila, my member of parliament actually, <laughs> in his budget debate on June 17th, he put the boring misconception to rest by succinctly stating, and I quote, what the PLP would have you believe is that we borrowed three million and our national debt went up by three million billion. But that is not what the numbers reveal. What they reveal, Mr. Speaker, is that we borrowed three billion, but our national debt only went up by one billion. Why, Mr. Speaker, he said, did we borrow three billion as the PLP says? But our total debt only went up by one million billion. Well, that is because of the three billion that we borrowed, we paid off two billion of existing debt and added one billion of this borrowing to the national debt. I hope that this clears up the government's borrowing to date, Minister Diagula also went on to say. We understand that our borrowings will be more than the PLP, we get that. But remember that the borrowings of the PLP were reduced by 1.5 billion in additional VAT money. And remember this too, think on this. 
in the one year, in, in that one year, we did not have a hurricane or a pandemic. That was in 2018-19. We demonstrated to the Bahamian people that we managed their money effectively and responsibly and reduced the deficit to 219 million, the lowest de deficit in a decade. Madam President, the government of the Bahamas has risen to the occasion of this COVID-19 pandemic and made difficult decisions that many have criticized. The most honorable Prime Minister, Dr. Hubert Minnis, has been the one most heavily criticized by many of the decisions made along with the cabinet of the Bahamas and as the competent authority. However, since being in the trade union movement and now in the realms of politics, Madam President, I understand that you must realize that as Mahatma Gandhi said, truth never damages a cause that is just. And also I'm reminded of the ro official rotary motto that states service above self and one profits most who serves best. So with all of the criticism levied, the tough decisions had to be made. That has brought us to this point where we have to date 104 cases, 11 deaths, one hospitalized case, active cases nine, recovered cases 84, and tests completed 2,366 as of June 24th, 2020. It appears, Madam President, that we are flattening the curve. So today, Madam President, I stand to salute the most honorable Prime Minister, Dr. Hubert Menes, who was our Prime Minister for such a time as this. The former Minister of Health, Dr. Duane Sands, the entire cabinet of the Bahamas, the Ministry of Health Emergency Operations Center, or what we also call the EOC, for the countless hours and times that they would have met and deliberated, sometimes seven days a week. The COVID-19 task forces on Nassau and Grand Bahama, and all who work tirelessly in the COVID-19 fight. Madam President, the government met and decisions were made to effectively deal with COVID-19. NIB has had to rise to the call and the Minister of National Insurance and Public Service, the Honorable Brenta Road, said during his contribution to the 2021 budget debate on June 12th, that the National Insurance Board has paid out in excess of $50 million from its fund since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. He went on to say of that amount, 38.1 million was paid out to 62,4800 disbursements of NIB unemployment benefits, expedited claims for 24,917 applicants. NIB also paid out 9,084,700 to 6,763 applicants of the government's unemployment assistance program for self-employed persons negatively impacted by the closing of the economy during the pandemic. Madam President, Minister Rule also said, it is estimated that more than 40,000 workers have either been interrupted or there has been some suspension from their earnings in the past three months, and that is due totally to COVID-19. National Insurance Board is also available online and not just to face. And I wish to say that to the public because a lot of people don't realize that. And NIB, they do respond when you even send them an email. The Honorable Frankie Campbell, Minister of Social Services on June 10th in his budget presentation, hailed the 2021 budget expanded 140 million social safety net as an unprecedented measure, Madam President, for an unprecedented time. He went on to say that I'm proud that this government has allotted some 86 million in direct support, with nearly 60 million allocated to the current fiscal year for social services assistance directly related to COVID-19. 
This expands the safety net to some 140 million in the wake of COVID-19. He added that the government has allocated some 10 million in the 2019-2020 supplementary budget to providing Hurricane Dorian related assistance for Abaco and Grand Bahama. Madam President, the Department of Social Services budget allocation for 2019 and 20 was 39.091 million to date. We have spent 36.67 million approximately. Minister Campbell went on to say, we have some bills outstanding and we are sure we are going to spend the entire budget. He went on to say, we are comfortable we will be able to go back for some additional money. This is aside from the 10 million set aside for Dorian. Additionally, Minister Campbell spoke to a new computer system and social services, stating that this system is user friendly to clients who can apply online for various programs. It provides current information on the ministries and departments, activities and programs. It can track applications where clients can lodge complaints. It can appeal the outcome of applications if they are confirmed. The system will prevent the duplication of services. It is the core of this duplication, which in many instances would have caused some delay, Minister Campbell said. Because we had to ensure that persons who are only getting what it is that they are entitled to and eligible for, as opposed to persons just getting it because it is there. And then when the person who is really in need goes, there is nothing left. This system will also be able to generate statistics and reports, among other features, this system will modernize the Department of Social Services. Madam President, the Minister of Education has reported in this budget debate that they receive, of course, the lion's share of the budget. He went on to say that 65,000 of our children are educated some nine months of the year, five days a week, six hours per week by thousands of trained teachers and support staff. And I'm sure plenty of parents can attest to this because the complaints that I heard when they had to be home tutoring their children over the last couple of months has been, I hate to say funny to a certain extent, I guess, as a teacher. And you know, they, they've sent out all kinds of things to teachers to say, I don't know how y'all do it because I can't get two of them to keep still. That's right. So how do teachers manage a class of 40? That's important. So teachers, I want you to know that I, I feel it, and I hope that when those parents come back, they bring you plenty of gifts. And then say, you know, I can do what you do. And it is so. We have to realize that we cannot do what teachers do. Because teachers are a special breed, and you have to be called to be a teacher. Some 600 receive scholarships annually to attend universities abroad. $17 million are spent at UB for 1,200 incoming freshmen to receive free tuition. $15 million is spent supporting the 25,000 students in private schools. $4 million was spent giving vouchers of 2,000 each for three and four year olds for, of course, preschool education. In addition, Family Island students also receive $500 monthly housing allowance. Another 1,200 students, incoming students, receive free tuition at BTV. VI, and some 4,200 are on the lunch program. Thousands of bus to and from school. Tens of millions of dollars are spent upgrading, repairing, and modernizing school campuses. $14 million so far have been spent digitizing the education system, which is very critical during this time. 3,030 students were beneficiaries of the free tuition initiative at UB. 1,774 at BTVI during fall 2019 and spring 2020. 300 students were also trained in the summer ICT program at BTVI last summer. 
and 350 persons were trained at the Department of Corrections in conjunction with the Ministry of National Security and the Inter Development, Inter American Development Bank, or what we would know as the IDB. Minister Lloyd went on to highlight things his ministry had to do during COVID 19, such as preschool, primary, and high school online instruction on the Ministry of Education virtual learning site, and of course, the many webinars and different modalities that teachers would have used to ensure that their students still was learning. COVID-19 curriculum officers and their team of teachers worked assiduously to ensure that curriculum implementation and instruction for students were not interrupted. And I think we ought to salute all of the teachers out there who had to adapt even if they didn't want to, to online themselves. Come on, let's give them a round of applause. Yeah. They had to use the Ministry of Education's virtual schools platform, and more recently, they had access to Cable Bahamas channels 295 and 296. And of course, those channels now are being dedicated to, of course, BJC and BGCSE, which exams are coming up. The BJC and BGCSE national examinations are now set to begin on July 13th, and virtual classes are specifically geared for students of grades 9 and 12 who are taking those exams. To date, Madam President, 4,373 virtual lessons and resources have been created by curriculum officers and their team of teachers. In this new budget period, we will continue with the procurement exercise, he said, with a view to provide a tablet for every student and a laptop for every teacher during this academic year in our primary schools. This will cost $3 million. The Ministry of Education will also facilitate a blended and learning environment. And uh, we realize that once COVID-19 has flattened or we flattened the curve, we and kids go back to school, social distancing will have to be enforced. And schools will have to adjust. We foresee that schools will have to probably be on a rotation-based system, the minister said, where one group of students receive face-to-face -face instruction while the other group of students receive instruction virtually. To ensure that we can achieve this, we would have to supply each student and teacher, as I said, with a device and even internet capability, because not every teacher may be able to afford to have internet access or even the students at home. We may also want to think about creating hotspots in certain communities where students probably can go and be able to do their lessons in a safe environment. Madam President, he also spoke to new ways that the Ministry of Education will have to operate moving forward. Looking at various models and in essence our entire country will have to change and adapt adapt due to COVID-19. Other areas in the budget which is critical to Bahamians is national security. Madam President, where the officers are working on the front line and are exposed daily to COVID-19. However, to date, we've had no cases of COVID-19 in the prison. And these prisoners were also receiving training from BTVI, which has had to be suspended. And the prison officers would have also completed a number of webinars. webinars. The prison is also in the process of developing a plan for farming, livestock rearing, and technical maintenance so that the prison itself can become self-sufficient. The Minister of National Security is looking at creating a correctional services commission similar to the teacher's commission that was created um, for correctional services, to continue to work with the Citizen Security and Justice Program to stop violence before it happens, establish a robust job corps program, and tips hotline are just some of the initiatives of the Ministry of National Security. Madam President, the Minister of Youth, Sports, and Culture, the Honorable Nanisha Roll, said that our ministry understands that its role and mandate is to lead in shaping the nation's youth ideology 
sporting methodology, and cultural philosophy. Significantly, we recognize that we must do this with a great degree of adaptability in these ever-changing times, she said. Adoption or the ability to change in response to one's environment is one of the greatest characteristics of a human being. Madam President, all ministries and agencies' budgets have been cut across the board by 20%, which will force every ministry to have to streamline how it does things in the 2020-2021 budget. Madam President, despite all of the criticism out there, this government has done and continues to ensure that Bahamians are taken care of during this COVID-19 pandemic, socially, economically, and of course, the most vulnerable. I ask all Bahamians to stop listening to all of the misinformation out there, but go and get the information yourself. We cannot continue to believe everything that is sent out on WhatsApp. If you get it, just take the time to research it yourself to find out if it's true before reading it, thinking it's true, and then sending it out. The budget is available for all Bahamians to review at the national website, www.bahamasbudget.gov.bs. And I encourage every Bahamian to read the budget for yourself. All right? You're listening to us in, in this honorable place, and you've listened to the House of Assembly. But if you need to verify something on your own, go and get the information yourself by visiting the website. Visit and read the budget at your leisure and decide for yourself what the facts are. Because there is a lot of misinformation, and I hate to say it, politicking that is going on. Madam President, in this honorable place, I represent the workers of this country and they make up a very large block that is often taken for granted. Labor, our greatest commodity, deserves to be treated with the same respect as the private sector or civil society. When there is something that is coming up on any national issue, labor must be consulted. I encourage all parliamentarians, particularly our cabinet ministers, to establish relationships with the unions that comes under their ministry or their purview. This relationship should be based on trust, social dialogue, and honesty, which does not mean that when you discuss things that you will agree on everything, but it is important to talk and work through issues together. That is what the tripartite system is all about. Just as you call the Bahamas Chamber of Commerce and Employees Confederation, you should call on the National Congress of Trade Unions and the Commonwealth Bahamas Trade Union Congress or the respective trade union leaders if it affects just the union in your workplace. And I know that we have been doing this and I thank the government for ensuring that on the COVID-19 task force, the NCTUB was represented and on the Economic Recovery Committee, O.B. Ferguson was also represented. The union climate has not been perfect, and as in all things, there is room for improvement. A positive step for the trade union movement would be if we see the industrial tribunal come under the civil division of the Supreme Court, but also still being able to keep the cost down and allowing labor advocates to be able to represent clients as they can now in the industrial tribunal. And the attorney general, of course, spoke to this. This is already being done in Caribbean countries like Trinidad and Tobago. I understand that four bills have been drafted and sent to the Ministry of Labor from the National Tripartite Council in regard to this, and I look forward to seeing this come to fruition, Minister Folks. He will make it up. As my classmate, I have the utmost confidence in him. <laughs> the Commonwealth. Bahamas Trade Union Congress and a number of union leaders have given me their concerns, which I will now address. And I wish to say these are their words. It's not my words that I'm saying. And please don't take offense to anything that is said. <laughs> I'm just the messenger. 
<laughs> TUC, which we know, has spoken to say that they're proud that the budget, that the gov government did not waver in their response to the needs of the payments from the onset of the pandemic. And they spoke, of course, to the 140 million, of course, policy response um, by giving social assistance, supporting employee retention, extending business continuity grants, increasing funding allocations, expanding subventions. And they say to illustrate the extent of our initiatives as of mid-May, the National Insurance Board paid out some 6.2 million for the government-funded unemployment program. And they went on to say, of course, that NIB is paid out 28.8 million in benefits. A lot of this I've already said, Madam President. But the TUC just want to say that in ex they would like to see extending the business continuity grants and loan support for small businesses to be done. Um, and it said it did not take into account small businesses which may have operated outside of the stringent criteria established to qualify for those grants. So those businesses and their employees are at a serious disadvantage going forward. So they're talking about businesses, small businesses that did not fall within the criteria that the Ministry of Finance, of course, would have given. They recommend that some less stringent criteria should be established to further assist these entrepreneurs to be able to take advantage of the proposed budget allotment, as mentioned. 30 million to expand the business support and continuity loan program for Bahamian entrepreneurs and small businesses. As it relates to increased funding allocations for the public health sector, they talk about the fact that the government, that they have not seen, um, when you look at the government department and line items 22, 41, 211, and line item 22, 41, 299, which deals with cleaning and other supplies, they have not seen an increase in that and are concerned that due to COVID-19, we will need additional cleaning and supplies to deal with this. They would suggest that these two line items be revisited and addressed. It must be noted that the National Tripartite Council, in an effort to look nationally at the effect of COVID-19, agreed for the government to waive the 12 weeks Employment Act provisions for employers, while the TUC made a request for the minister to increase the 13 weeks employment benefits to 26 weeks. This is still something that they would like to see happen. It was done? Okay. Which was done? That's good news, TUC. It was done. Um, from what they see from the Ministry of Health budget, they're saying that there are no provisions to address health care workers. And I don't know which line item it is specifically in. And then they've gone on to talk about the junior doctors who have a myriad of complaints and concerns. And I'm sure the minister will address these things. The Bahamas Doctors Union has been plagued, as they said, with challenges pertaining to fair work practices. And of course, adherence, they claim, to the registered industrial agreement between PHA and their union. Further, our efforts have been hampered by the absence of a functioning mechanism to redress grievances against a government agency in the Bahamas. The Bahamas Doctors' Union, the TUC said, has sought to hold negotiations. They filed trade disputes and held strike action without resolution. They say they are at a place where they realize that unless substantive legislative and procedural changes happen, that they say create an entity outside of the Department of Labor that is truly impartial and empowers the body to adjudicate matters and impose penalties, they may ne never be able to get what is legally due. Um, and Minister, you can address that when you speak, please, because I'm sure you will have more information than I would. <laughs> it's before the tribunal. Okay. So they don't have a date as yet. Okay. Some of the issues that they claim the BDU has 
is failure on the part of the public hospitals authority to adhere to the union's registered industrial agreement. They stopped paying doctors for working holidays despite an agreement and memorandum for the same. Um, to date, doctors have still not been paid money so and not being paid for holiday weekends. They mentioned interns being evicted from housing that PHA had provided to interns for years. And in lieu of housing, they were paid a housing allowance. Um, the PHA refuses to pay the allowance or provide alternative housing, and they have filed a trade dispute on this matter. Failure to maintain a safe working environment, and they speak about the doctor's lounge, which they say have mold, and the air conditioning does not work. And the environment, of course, anybody knows that mold is in the air, yeah, has caused doctors to have asthma and allergic rhinitis in others. And there's been no organization safety officer which has safety officers will report, which has not been released to the union as per the industrial agreement, Article 13.01C, which states when an employee believes that he is required or forced to work under unhealthy and unsafe conditions, he shall notify his immediate head of department who shall cause the matter to be communicated to the employer and the union and where warranted the necessary steps shall be taken to correct any of the aforesaid conditions as soon as possible. Contrary to normal customs and practices, PHA has been issuing two-year and one-year contracts to physicians, putting them at a disadvantage when applying for loans or seeking a driver's license. And we all know any behavior that goes to the bank, if they're not hired permanently, and on permanent status, that the bank will not give them a loan if they are on a one-year or two-year contract. So that will make them ineligible for loans for a home or a car. Failure to advance doctors for one year, despite having completed internship for over 30 years, for over 30 doctors were forced to work at a $20,000 deficit for over one year. PHA is entered into separate contracts with union members and is including stipulations for employment not agreed to in the industrial agreement. And this is in essence, if it is happening, union busting. The TUC also speaks to an ineffective, defunct labor department. And quite apparently, all of these issues that they have have been listed as trade disputes, but as the minister said the matter has been referred to the industrial tribunal and I would suggest, I would hope that the industrial tribunal will call a meeting soonest and urgently to address these issues between PHA and the Bahamas Doctors Union. Of course, they're saying that the legally obtained strike vote for failure of PHA to pay doctors for holiday weekends is met with a Supreme Court order forcing the doctors back to work. And that too, I guess, is at the Industrial Tribunal as well. Doctors that participated in the strike had the time deducted from their vacation, and they have filed trade disputes on this matter, but have not received a date from the Department of Labor as yet. Failure to grant doctors private license, quite apparently the Medical Act of 2013-13, removed the right of members bargaining to hold private practices, without meeting the arbitrary demands of the Medical Council. In many instances, doctors must seek legal action to have that license issued. This practice has created a bottleneck where doctors can only be employed by the government. And I see Madam President shaking her head and saying that that is not so. So I'll talk to you one-on-one -on -one afterwards so that I can respond to them in regard to this. The TUC is expressing a need for the Bahamas government to pay the holiday pay to the doctors. They said an agreement was reached with the Prime Minister and a meeting needs to be convened to come up with a formula to pay outstanding payments for working overtime. As it relates to the nurses, the Bahamas Nurses Union, they are also owed overtime pay as well as payments to the midwives in accordance with the industrial agreement with the Bahamas Nurses Union. As it relates to water and sewage, the corporation Cooperation is, cooperation is not honoring the industrial agreement and the Department of Labor as far back as March 2019. 
The Department of Labor has also failed to conciliate trade disputes filed on behalf of the managers at Water and Sewage. And we know that there are some issues with who is president of the managerial union at Water and Sewage. There's also a situation with the Bahamas General Workers Union, who is having trouble negotiating contracts with Bahama Rock, Bahamas Waste, Ortec, and BAIC. The Ministry of Labor has not held or failed to organize conciliation meetings to resolve these out overdue outstanding collective bargaining disputes. The TUC also have a situation with Sandals in which the Director of Labor and the Minister of Labor failed to schedule conciliation meetings, they claim, to settle this dispute with the Bahamas Hotel Maintenance and Allied Workers Union. As to who is the bargaining agent for workers, workers at that hotel. And again, I'm sure that the minister will address that as he does speak today. Finally, at the Hutchison Lucaya Limited Hotel in Grand Bahama, the hotel has refused to pay 3,500 to the recently severed workers, nor the 40 workers who were made redundant. This amount was only paid to the 23 workers who remained at the hotel. This imbalance has to be corrected by the government who are the ultimate owners of the property. I move now to some of the affiliates from the, from the NCTUB. Kyle Wilson, who, who I wish to congratulate, is the newly elected president of the Bahamas Electrical Workers Unions, and I wish to congratulate him and his executive team. He states that, and he is a very young man um, working at BEC, and he would like to see the reintroduction of the apprenticeship training at BBL be done again. It was something that BEC did for years. And we know that some of the better persons coming out of BEC will undergo that program. And so he would like to see the apprenticeship program started again, as this would give smart young men and women a chance to succeed in life through career-focused training. Some people just need a start or chance at life to succeed and become great. This program was for that purpose, and it should be reintroduced and budgeted for. The Sean Sawyer, president of the Bahamas Financial Services Union, said, given that COVID-19 has sent us into the digital economy, technology, how do we increase the amount of our people in this field? We must look to rebuild a first-rate hospital in Grand Bahama to cover the Northern Bahamas. And then she asked, what is the plan for Abaco? We have persons still not able to return home because the bank won't rebuild until infrastructure is in place. And of course, the Bahamas Financial Services Union represents the members of First Caribbean. With this, the digital age, she speaks to NIB, better collecting payments and collecting from delinquent employers. Can we develop benefits for self-employed customers that encourage encourages them to pay. And so they're talking about self-employed persons. A lot of them are not encouraged to pay on IB because it is extremely high. And she says, suggesting that we find ways to encourage people to pay. We need continued efforts to reduce electrical bills, which will increase the domestic and foreign investments. And she spoke to a recent articles written by Dr. Rogers, which speaks about foreign investment and purchase of government bonds can also be helpful. Ms. Sawyer says we must look to make our education system better. We are supposedly the leader in the Central Americas, yet our people are not as well educated as in times past. We must reduce or even cease handouts and give a hand up is what she said. And, and I, I do agree with this sentiment, and this is coming from a trade unionist. We're not all bad. <laughs> Madam President, we must reduce issuing work permits under the guise of not having anyone able to do the work in the Bahamas. And we know that. We know that businesses put criteria in there for them to be able to speak a foreign language, sometimes seven and eight. And yet they know that the person that they're bringing in will not be able to do that. Madam President, Teresa Mortimer, the president of the Bahamas Financial Services Union, also said, it is no surprise that this budget is largely defined by the economic emergency that has been thrust on us by the Corona-19 virus. 
and the still rippling economic impact of the monstrous and catastrophic Hurricane Dorian. Together, these events have delivered the fastest, deeper, not deepest economic shock to the Bahamas since the onset of World War II. Needless to say, these events have forced us to shift to a new course of action. COVID-19 has increased pressure on government revenues and on public expenditure. It has suppressed our export sector, temporarily shut down our domestic economy, and dramatically slowed our short-term prospects of economic growth. This comes on the heel of us recovering from Hurricane Dorian. Because of current realities, the landscape we operate in has completely changed. It demands a different approach and a different set of solutions from the government. Madam President, Sister Mortimer said, even though our ultimate objective has not changed, to achieve sustainable growth for both the medium and long term. In the Bahamas, our short-term strategy and our overall thinking about the future has had to shift. The Bahamas Financial Services Union supports the budget and looks forward to the changes in the financial sector. We look forward to the changes that are coming in the financial sector. We should include sending home of multinationals in the sector and making way for Bahamians to take their rightful positions. Brother Darren Woods, president of the Bahamas Hotel Catering and Allied Workers, one of the oldest and largest unions, said that they're not directly affected by the budget because we don't represent any government agencies. However, they would appreciate if the government would consider extending the unemployment benefit payments, which they have because the vast majority of their workers in the hospitality industry will not return to work until October or December 2020. He also questioned the legality of making persons redundant as the Section 28 of the Act has been suspended. They're concerned about the number of changes being made in the workplace where um, employees are combining jobs and making persons redundant. Ronnie and Brister, president of the Bahamas Musician and Entertainers Union, says that he don't feel that the musicians get the respect that they are due, and he said that they're pioneers and have promoted tourism from its inception. They would like to be more involved in the People to People program, Minister De Aguilar. He would also like to see some provisions being made to provide assistance to musicians affected by the pandemic with unemployment, given that concessions have been made for other workers. But other than that, they support the budget and look forward to the country moving forward. Ms. Rosalie McKenzie speaks to the same thing with a person being laid off or even permanently terminated, which is the concern for, of course, unions in this country. She said, workers have to come together and understand that we have to go the extra mile. She's of the opinion that many workers will suffer losses due to severance packages, which may not be the properties we represent, but who knows what will happen. Comments from faculty at the University of Bahamas. They're concerned that no budget has been, um, audited budget has been done for the university in the last, or audited financial statements for the last six years. And one must ask why these have not been done and have called for a forensic audit to be done at UB. Other comments speaks to Sanitac, maintenance. I'm finished. I'm finished. Could I just wrap up? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just need to get them out. The people must be heard. <laughs> She's, um, they're speaking about Sanitac maintenance and they're saying, saying that they seem to be a primary service provider for all ministries. And of course, they spoke to whether overseas travel has been reduced, which is ha it has due to the pandemic. And they feel, Minister Labor, that if you would enforce the fine for persons who fail to show up to conciliation, that we could collect some money. Um, because we know that we have a number of employees that do not show up. And even unions, if they don't show up to conciliation, they should be fined. That would increase our revenue. Um, they talk about fuel charges, and they would like to know if government ever considered electric cars. Um, what efforts are being made to promote ed energy efficiency within the public sector, to encourage consumers to be more energy and water independent. Um, and again, 
directing research projects to UB and BGVI first rather than external persons. Madam President, in conclusion, I think of the many persons out there fighting the battle for us, like the nurses, doctors, and all allied health professionals, the police force, the defense force, the custom officers, the immigration officers, aviation personnel, grocery store workers, sanitation workers, bankers, all essential workers, the labor movement, the private sector, the civil society. Despite these persons putting their lives on the line for us daily, there are many of us who simply refuse to wear masks, wash our hands, and simply social distance ourselves in public. I stand here today to make a plea to all persons to consider their family when they come in contact, who they come into contact with on a daily basis, to understand that if they get exposed to COVID-19 by not wearing a mask, washing their hands, or socially distancing, you will take COVID-19 back home to your mother, your father, your wife, your husband, your grandfather, your grandmother, your children, your aunts, your uncles, cousins, boyfriends, or significant other. The choice is yours. And we must think of everyone we love who will be around us when we don't practice safe behaviors. Think of these decisions when you decide not to wear your mask, wash your hands, or socially distance. I say to all behemoths, none of us are invincible. And this has been a problem, particularly among the youth. And Jamal, Senator Moss, this is perhaps something that we need to address with the young people who seem to think that they are invincible and cannot get COVID-19. Madam President, as a country, we must come together as one family to advance the Bahamas to the next level. We must put aside our politics and realize that there is only one Bahamas. Yeah. And we must support this government for the next two years, whether or not we supported them, like them, or for whatever reason. We have a country to save. Yes. We have a country to build. Yes. But we need everyone on board in order to build. It is going to take all of us. Yes. Madam President, no budget as you, as you will ever be all that we want. However, it is that it is what we have today to deal with the pandemic and Dorian. And I stand proudly today to support the budget for 2020-21. May God continue to bless the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. As many, the chair recognizes Senator Darius. Good morning, Madam President. Good morning, Senate colleagues. Good morning. Good morning, Bahamas. Madam President, I am humbled to rise today in this honorable house to make contribution to the 2020-2021 budget. Firstly, I must express my sincere honor to the Most High God for this strategic positioning and appointment to, to this place. I commend and thank the most honorable Dr. Hubert Minnis, Prime Minister of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, for giving young people a seat not just in the room, but at the table of power. I especially applaud my Prime Minister for believing in millennials, uplifting millennials, and especially young millennial women in highlighting the importance of our voice at a time like this. I would also like to congratulate Madam President, all of the outstanding, smart, talented, gifted primary school, high school, and college university graduates uh, that have completed their studies this year. In particular, I would like to highlight my eldest daughter, Brianna, who, along with the Bishop Michael Eldon Warriors, grade six class, graduated to enter junior high. I would also like to congratulate the youngest member of parliament, Travis Robinson, and my Senate colleague, Senator Isaac Dotson, for also congratulating graduating. This particular graduating class of seeing uh, the worst of times, and so we send our prayers and wish them well during this time. I would also like to say to the teachers uh, who have 
in this country, they have done an awesome job during the crisis time. Uh, they have been on Google Classroom, Edmodo, IXL, uh, Zoom classes. We appreciate you. Teaching is a noble profession. I say to all of the graduates that you are the guardians of the future economic empowerment, distributors in this nation, equal opportunity dispensers, the defenders of our social justice, and leaders of change in this country and abroad. Madam President, I must also commend the churches and the non-governmental agencies that were out in the COVID-19 pandemic, specifically in Grand Bahama. In particular, I would like to mention the church that I attend, whose pastor is Pastor Brian Darius, for being the first church on the streets in Grand Bahama, distributing uh, care packages and food for those that are in need. I also make mention of Dudley Said, Reach Out Ministries, Jubilee Cathedral, and Change Ministries under the leadership of Apostle Leo and Catherine Adderley for the awesome humanitarian efforts provided in Grand Bahama, Abaco, Andros, and Exuma during one of the most critical times in our nation's history. Without the presence of these NGOs, churches, other civic organizations, and community helpers, we would have experienced, and I want to list these, four times greater risk of poverty, five times the average suicide rate, seven times more likely for the young ladies to become teen mothers, more likely to face abuse and neglect, 32 more times likely to go to prison, two times more likely to use a, a dr abuse drugs, two times more likely to suffer obesity, two times more likely to drop out of school, more and more likely for the young persons having trouble in establishing appropriate sex roles and, I, and gender identity. So I want to say to the NGOs, the churches, the community helpers and civic organizations, thank you. Madam President, the world as we knew it before is no longer. We are now in a revolutionary gap, okay. which means to be in a time involving complete or dramatic change market new or introducing radical change. A gap speaks to a space, a break, or an opening. Right. We are literally in a new era of Bahamas, a new day in our nation and around the globe. Throughout history, the islands of the Bahamas have been ferociously tested by hurricanes, yet our indomitable spirit, our resilient resolve, and our faith in God have always caused us to rebuild stronger and better than before. Madam President, on September 1st, 2019, we were yet again faced with a catastrophic and apocalyptic Hurricane Dorian. She ravaged through Abaco and Grand Bahama, sweeping, dismantling, and tearing everything in its path, carrying high waves, life, limbs, lots, and everything in between leaving over three billion plus damage, leaving over three billion plus dollars in damage and years of rebuilding to be done. The entire world is experiencing a climate change right now that will test our faith and capacity. Now, this global pandemic, which forced a shutdown, even in the Bahamas. Indeed, Madam President, we are in a revolutionary gap. This is the time for us to unlock new and specific keys to lift up certain barriers so that diversification can take place in our economy and wider society. The Bahamas has always been a pioneer in many ways, not just in the region, but in the world. And we should continue this trend even now. Madam President, I say revolutionary times call for revolutionary measures. Yeah, yeah. During this time of the coronavirus, our key objectives are public health and safety, the social safety net, employment generation, the development of the domestic economy, small business and government reform along with sustaining economic growth in what financial analysts calls a recessionary period. I must commend the Minister of Finance and the Deputy Prime Minister, the Honorable K. Peter Turnquist and his team for providing proactive economic recovery solutions. The 
the Bahamas government through the Ministry of Finance has implemented our digital fiat currency, the sand dollar that was rolled out in the Exuma region in December 2019. This digital sand dollar can be used at local restaurants, supermarkets, street vendors, and even bill payments, especially on the islands where there is no or limited access to physical banks. A bold and progressive move in a fast pace and ever-changing economic climate. Madam President, revolutionary times call for revolutionary measures. Yes. The Bahamas is the ninth country globally to have produced its own digital currency, wow. not a cryptocurrency, nice. backed by the central bank and equivalent to, in every aspect, our paper dollar. England is now following our lead England? to implement their own as well. Quite a visionary stance by our leadership. leadership right? Madam President, revolutionary times call for revolutionary measures. The most honorable prime minister, Minister, the Ministry of Finance and the deputy prime minister should be commended for the economic foresight and financial vigilance to recognize the importance of providing behemoths with an alternative to faster, more effective online transaction of business. We have just seen how important uh, this strategic move was in this global pandemic, where businesses were shut down physically and the only transactions being made were technically online. Madam President, I've said it before and I will say it again. Revolutionary times call for revolutionary measures. Every decision that we have made has been to protect families, protect communities, businesses, and to invest in building a better, a stronger, and a more modern Bahamas. History shows us that it was the FNM administration that successfully navigated this nation out of the 2008-2009 global financial meltdown. Wow. Madam President, we have done it before. And with the wisdom, with the might, and the strategy of the Almighty God, we will do it again. The Bahamas can have confidence in the face of this global crisis that we will make the tough decisions. Yes, we will. Yeah. But we are the best party on record, willing and able to pull our economy back to a stable, prosperous financial footing. The Bahamian populace chose the Free National Movement Administration because we have proven to be better at national governance. We have witnessed firsthand the effects of political debauchery and instability under the previous administration. Obviously, this type of political uncertainty is not what the Bahamas needs at this critical time in our nation's history. Madam President, we are in a battle to save our economy, our families, our communities. Madam President, revolutionary times call for revolutionary leadership. In an effort to expand our social support system in the Bahamas, we have the lowest, the lowest recorded deficit and fiscal ratio ever achieved by any administration in the Bahamas of 1.7% or $222.4 million. Back to school VAT holiday on school supplies, clothing, and any other material. $48 million for unemployment assistance to the National Insurance Board. $17 million increase for food voucher program and other social programs at the Ministry of Social Services. $11 million increase funding for social services. Let me repeat that again. $11 million increased funding for social services. $120 million in tax credits and deferrals to support continued employment through the Department of Inland Revenue. $50 million to expand the small business development programs in our communities. 515 dollars 
million dollars in public construction projects to stimulate the economy. 20% custom duty reduction on building supplies. Tax reduction on fishing and agricultural materials to stimulate private sector growth. Wow. The Hurricane Dorian tax relief extended for Abaco and Grand Bahama. And of course, our digital transformation of all government departments and services uh, led by this free national administration. Yes. Madam President, all of what was aforementioned underscores the need for and shows the importance of education of which I turn my attention to. Nelson Mandela said, and I quote, money won't create success, the freedom to make it real, end quote. What will distinguish economies today and moving forward are ideas, energy, and the level of education. Any country with ideas, energy, and education will be amidst the movers and the shakers in the world. A well-informed and educated mind is the best security against poverty. The significance and importance of upgraded education to our society cannot be overemphasized as it is paramount for the formation of character, creativity, intellect, and thus national development. Conversely, a growing uneducated or underemployed population will lead to social unrest rather than economic growth. For a nation that is well-educated shall be so much more productive. Yeah. It is noteworthy to mention at this juncture, Madam President, the accomplishments and tangible benefits we have achieved in education to date. From 2017 to present, some 600 plus students have benefited from our scholarship program to universities abroad. $17 million for 1,200 incoming freshmen to receive free tuition at the University of the Bahamas. $15 million to support 25,000 students in private schools. $4 million in vouchers spent for kindergarten children, three and four year olds. 1,200 BTVI incoming students receiving free tuition. $14 million spent digitizing the educational system. 650 trained students uh, are in the summer program for the ICT. Madam President, the global pandemic has shifted education drastically in the last three months. <laughs> Even though many of our children were not used to this type of learning, yeah. the majority of our children are interactive, tactile, and classroom type students. And so we talked about the Zoom classes, the Google classrooms, the Edmodo, the IXL, uh, that were good eye openers for our children to learn and be immersed in the field of technology. Technology, Madam President, right now is central to development. It touches one and is, it touches one and all and is a very important instrumental and is a very important instrument of national progress. We have done well, but we can do better and that's why we have a, uh, a, a department that is digitizing uh, all of our governmental departments. Madam President, revolutionary times call for revolutionary measures. Madam President, at this time, I would like to highlight all of our essential workers, in particular the nurses, the doctors, the medical teams, the gas pump attendants, the cashiers at convenience stores, the garbage collectors, the shelf stockers, cleaners, immigration officers, customs officers, police officers, defense force officers, the bankers and the teachers, all of those that stood on the front line to assist us during this global pandemic, I say thank you and may the Lord continue to bless you. Madam President, please allow me to turn my attention to Urban Renewal Grand Bahama and Bimini, of which I am Deputy Director. I would like to report as a means of accountability 
for transparency, in particular in this department. Madam President, Urban Renewal is a social development initiative that creates and implements policies and programs to improve, empower, revitalize, rehabilitate, renovate, and restore individuals, families, and communities, and relevant spaces where there is urban decay. So the following information, Madam President, is presented as a means of reporting, recording, and accounting for transparency in the department. For the budget year 2019 to 2020, our community assessments were 3,850, small home for player, 36 homes with no damages, literacy program, 473 persons have benefited from our literacy program, boys mentoring program, 1,918 young boys. Girls Mentoring Program, 2,620 young girls. After School Program, 2,978 children. Computer, 182 individuals. Sewing Program, 820 persons to date. Art and Craft, 1,072. The Musical Band Program, 508 active girls and boys. And I send condolences to the family of Zion Clark who was a member of the band in Grand Bahama, and he just passed away. May his soul rest in peace. The senior program has seen 5,756 seniors. The care packages distributed in the community ranges in the thousands. Feeding program, 28,270 persons. Suspension program, 50 children, sign language, 30 persons. Cleanup initiatives, 108 inclusive of Bimini. Special initiative programs where Urban Renewal partners with the court by allowing persons who were released on conditional discharge to complete community hours. We have seen a total of 37. In 2019, there was a total of 28,270 persons held to date. To date. So that's from 2017 to date. There's a total of 54,989 persons assisted by the Urban Renewal Program in Grand Bahama and Bimini. And that is an increase of 28,270 persons from last year. Empowerment programs include backyard farming, at risk youth and adults, computer literacy, exam preparatory assistance, book depository library, adult literacy, disability empowerment, uh, the Urban Renewal Ban, and many more uh, programs. Madam President, Proverbs 31, 8 to 9, the New Living Translation. And I quote, it says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those who are being crushed. Yes, speak up for the poor and helpless and see that they get justice, end quote. Madam President, it would be remiss of me if I did not lift up my voice in this place, not as a mother, not as a wife, not as a leader, but as a woman. Madam President, the COVID-19 global pandemic is harming health, social, and the economic well-being worldwide of women who are at the center. First and foremost, women are leading the health response. Women make up almost 70% of the healthcare workforce, exposing us, not them, exposing us to a greater risk of infection. Globally, women make up 85% of nurses and midwives in over 104 countries where data is available according to the OECD 2020 report. All health and social care workers are facing exceptional demands through this crisis, but the strain is likely to be particularly acute for women care workers and women on the front line. Confinement measures, school and child care facility closures have increased the demand for unpaid work at home of which many of our women fall break. At the same time, 
women are also shouldering much of the burden at home, given school and childcare facility closures and long-standing gender inequalities. Women also face high risks of job and income loss and face increased risk of violence, exploitation, abuse, or harassment during times of crisis and quarantine. According to the OECD report 2020, women are the most heavily effective during this crisis. At this point, in terms of economic and social policy, where possible, we need to apply gender lens to emergency policy measures concerning women. More than 60% of our households in the Bahamas are led by women who have been, who many of them have been shut down without jobs, without businesses or income due to the global pandemic. We are ever grateful to the National Insurance Board for the unemployment benefit that is allocated for such a purpose. But I speak more specifically of empowering our women as opposed to providing a temporary benefit. We thank Minister Roll for this benefit that is still in full effect. So what are you saying, Senator Turner Darius? I'm glad that you asked. I am talking about, <laughs> I am talking about women empowerment like our neighbors to the north, the United States have done it. Create an enhanced policy to increase women's participation in decision-making at, at the executive levels of leadership. Create funds uh -huh. and grants specifically for women entrepreneurs. Listen, I would love to see a specific grant or fund for a basket weaver or braider from Andros. Well, let's do it. To take a craft global. But she has to wait on a foreigner to come and steal her idea and get rich and pose in, in Forbes magazine. I'm talking about woman empowerment. Woman empowerment. I would like to see the jewelry maker in Grand Bahama who specializes in Bahamian beauty, brilliant, unique designs that are ready for the international market but needs funding. I would love to see the hair products by Candice and Elutra receive a grant to market in China, in Europe, in Asia, women empowerment. The young woman who's an excellent chef that could disgrace any chef from Cordon Bleu, package a bohemian recipe and sell it in Walmart, Sam's, and other stores around the globe. Women empowerment. We have done well. And I say this, we have done well, but at this critical junction in our nation's history, we can and we must do more for the women. Just like the United States, we can develop a women's empowerment and development initiative, advancing the causes of women as they have done in February 2019. At this point, I would like to uh, say that the Ministry of Social Services and Urban Development, uh, the Department of Gender Affairs, they've done well. They have done very, very well. But at this place, we can do more. Madam President, I have been leading, training, and empowering women for over 15 years now. Next month, I have a mentorship class, mentorship and leadership class of women from all over the globe, Canada, Africa, South America, United States, and from every island in the Bahamas to help train uh, these young women. Uh, so we have done well, Madam President, but we can do more. In ancient times, when nations were in crisis and experiencing rigorous times, they always called for the skillful women to help them lead. Ask Barack, who helped, uh, who was helped by Deborah, and Esther, who helped to save a nation and a people from extinction. It was Abigail who helped David during treacherous times. We must empower women. Uh, both of all our major political parties have done well. The PLP has done well, they have helped women. The FNM has done well. We have proof, our latest senator, uh, Senator Dean Boswick, is proof of the free national movement, rich female legacy. Her mother is an icon and a general in our party. And in this country. So I say we have done well. I say we have done well. But we can and we must do more. 
I will go a bit further. I will go a bit further and challenge all of the political parties to be intentional about the United Nations 17 Sustainable Goals, in specific number five, about at least having 30% minimum participation of female candidates and have it enshrined in your political party's constitution to ensure balance in perspective in women in leadership, in women in politics, in women empowerment. So I say to all of the political parties, put your money where your mouth is, and let's empower women, all of our women. When women do better, economies do better. Christine Lagarde, the former managing director of the IMF, she said, and I quote it again, when women do better, economies do better. And so, Madam President, as I've said before, I say it again. Revolutionary times call for revolutionary moves. We must empower our women, all of our women, black women, white women, grand bohemian women, andrus women, uh, uh, Cat Island women. We must empower our women. Madam President, today, looking at where we are at now as a nation and where we have journeyed from amidst such perilous times in less than 12 months, experiencing twin catastrophes, I have deduced, we can deduce, that we have some of the best governmental leaders in this region, and I dare say the world. The entire Caribbean watched and followed our lead and the measures that we took in response to the COVID-19 and the COVID-19 pandemic to follow suit, the entire Caribbean. I commend our Prime Minister, the doctor, Hubert Minnis, who stood up and encouraged this nation, inspired this nation, and led this nation uh, during this time. Uh, and he was really walking in top form in particular, especially during this COVID-19 time. This administration is to be commended for the testicular fortitude, financial wit, wisdom, and strength to make the necessary changes so that people can live so that the people can thrive and so that we can prosper so that a generation can excel. The Bahamas is a blessed nation, replete with human and natural resources that can be a great stimulation to our economy. This is a great time to harness this potential. We must spend the necessary funds to conduct research so that we can see activity in new and viable areas. We are at a crossroad in our economy, a very good juncture to explore alternative sources of energy such as solar, wind, ocean energy. We are at a crossroad, a very good juncture to explore manufacturing on large scales, furniture building, aquaculture, boat building, souvenir production, textile manufacturing, sponging, movie development, media production, extensive farming, online learning, and so much more. However we look at it, diversification is the order of the day. Revolutionary times, Madam President, call for revolutionary measures. Madam President, the Bahamas people, the Bahamian people, have entrusted the Minnis administration with managing the affairs of this nation and safeguarding our future. It is a responsibility that we are honored to have, and our commitment to see it through is unwavering. One must admit, from we took office in 2017, the strict financial measures undertaken by the Ministry of Finance have been tough but carefully weighed destiny decisions. Lest we forget, the PLP, with all their eloquence and, intelli and intelligence, left the country in a junk bond status. For not one, not two, but three, but four consecutive years. So I thank God today for this FNM government. Revolutionary times, Madam President, call for revolutionary leadership. Madam President, this is one of the most important budget periods in our nation's existence. And it is evident that we are putting Bahamians first. This government is restoring dreams and fueling the hope of its people by investing in our people and capitalizing on our Bahamian potential. I am most pleased, Madam President, that there are no new taxes or tax increase in the budget, nor has any civil servant been cut 
during this crisis time. That speaks of good financial balance and good governance. Madam President, we on this side, we are confident that our overall economic recovery, achieving financial stability and prosperity in this country will be a reality and it will be respected. Madam President, may we remember the words of our national pledge while we fight with all our might to make an indelible impact, not just on our nation, but on our generation. We are one people united in love and service. May the Lord bless and multiply our every endeavor to rebuild, to restore, and to revive our people and our economy. I support this budget, I support my Prime Minister, and I support this government. Thank you. Madam President, um, i just like to rise on a point of order. I didn't want to stop the good senator in flight. But during her presentation, she used the word debauchery when speaking of the prior administration. And that word is unparliamentary. And I would like for her to strike it from the record, please. Yes. Yeah, I'll check from the record. Yeah, I'll check from the record. So you, you, you have no objection to the statement. Thank you. Right away. Right away. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, before I start, I want to also join the chorus in celebrating and congratulating all of the 2020 graduates who have done well, who have achieved one of the best achievements that they can to start off in their adult life. And so we're happy to celebrate the graduates. And I'm also happy to celebrate my niece, Destiny Taylor, one who was diagnosed many years ago as being dyslexic. And she's one of a 2020 graduate and graduated as the valedictorian of her high school. And I want to put on record how proud I am of her, even with her diagnosis. So Madam President, I rise today to give contribution to the budget debate. And I am grateful, as always, for the opportunity to stand in this place and lend my voice to address the concerns of the Bayman public at large. I'm thankful to the leader of the opposition, Honorable Philip Brave Davis, for the confidence that he has displayed in me. And I can assure you that I have the same confidence that when he becomes prime minister in less than 23 months, he will rescue this country out of the dire situation we find ourselves in. Madam President, over the past 10 months, our country has experienced tremendous heartbreak and pain as a result of the uncertainty and destruction brought on by the twin crisis of Hurricane Dorian and COVID-19. These are truly challenging times for the Bahamian people, and in times of unprecedented difficulties, it is a moral imperative that a government that understands the responsibility of protecting its people responds with compassionate leadership. Madam President, I know that the Bahamian people are tired of promises made by politicians that haven't been kept. People are tired of change being talked about, but not sufficiently delivered. And they are certainly tired of being told it's the people's time when the government so obviously cares so little for the people. And while life in the 21st century has thrown challenge after challenge at our country, I know that we can and will rise again with the right leader. 
right. Madam President, from the onset, I wish to make clear that every government that has ever existed has experienced difficult situations. I would go even further and say that the true test of any government is the ability to make sound decisions, emphasis on sound decisions when things get tough. Since the global recession of 2008, every administration has been faced with a challenging fiscal and economic reality that necessitated innovative approaches to utilizing limited funds. This is not a novel situation nor is it unique to the current administration. A quick review of news stories at the time will reveal the dire situation that the progressive Liberal Party found the country in when we assumed office in 2012. It was the now Prime Minister who rightfully declared that the country was left in a wheelchair by his party, the FNM. Madam President, despite these challenges, the PLP embarked on a progressive and ambitious agenda that included strategic national development, economic diversification, and empowerment of the Bahamian people. Just take a look at the infrastructural development that took place. Look at the airports, fire stations, clinics, and government complexes we built through the Bahamas to improve services to local communities and provide jobs for skilled laborers. We established institutions like BAMSI and the National Training Agency to empower our people to take advantages of diversified opportunities. We established the National High School Diploma and oversaw the launch of the University of the Bahamas. We increased educational scholarships by 267%. 267%. And 67%. We revitalized the tourism sector through facilitating the completion and grand opening of Bahama and the expansion of events and sports based tourism. And let the record reflect that the increase in tourism that this FM government celebrates today is a direct result of the Bahama investment they said was fake when they were campaigning. My goodness, you should be ashamed. The PLP attracted numerous major investments and launched NHI. And honestly, Madam Vice President, the list goes on and on. But the point here is that every government faces constraints that require difficult decisions to be made. But these constraints are not to be used as excuses for a lack of vision and accomplishments. The PLP chose to invest in Bahamians, while the current administration chose to pursue ill-advised measures that stagnated economic growth and never performed as advertised when it came to reducing budgetary deficits. Year after year, despite warnings from the opposition, as well as the private sector, this government continued to make decisions that were decimating Bahamian households. If they had only prioritized the Bahamian people, the country would be better equipped to respond to the cries that are occurring today. Unfortunately, a series of poor choices and misplaced priorities have made a bad situation worse. Madam President, it is said that choices are the hinges of destiny. And I am afraid that the choices made by this current administration have jeopardized the future of our country. They lack all solutions and economic growth plan. We need to overcome the unprecedented times and challenges that we are facing. In place of innovation, we have heard excuses. If you listen to the cabinet members talk, you would think that nothing was ever their fault and they were forced to make the decisions they have made for the past three years. The Bahamian people whom I stand here on behalf of deserve better and need to be told the truth. So what is the truth, Madam President? The truth is reflected in this budget and all of their previous budgets. We are here today because of poor choices and misplaced priorities. These poor choices were leading us down the wrong path even
even before Hurricane Dorian and COVID-19. Their record level of borrowing $3 billion gross in three years and $4.5 billion in four years with very little to show for it is inexcusable. It is time for this administration to communicate truthfully to the Bahamian people regarding the detrimental impact of their agenda over the past three years. And to add salt to an already open wound, we are now presented with a budget that does not have the vision and solutions needed to face what we call the new normal in a post-COVID-19 world. In this budget, we should be going beyond the status quo, Madam President. Where are the big ideas? I heard almost every member from the government side in that place toot this slogan, the new normal. But it appears that we are approaching recovery with the same old, same old. This administration's short-sighted approach to planning has failed to protect the future of the Bahamian people. Where is this budget poised to take us in the long term? The answer is nowhere. And Madam President, I remind them that the first step in fixing a problem is acknowledging that there is one. It is time for this FNM administration to acknowledge its incompetence and accept responsibility for their actions if they want a chance at finding valid solutions. But they won't admit the errors in their ways. If only they did, we would be much further along today. Needless to say, our country deserves better. The Bahamian people deserves better. They need a government who will prioritize their needs every day, not one who pretends they care when they feel the heat from the people. The distinction between actually caring and only pretending to care is all the difference in the world. Madam President, the term essential workers is one we've heard a lot since the start of COVID-19. But the PLP is a party which has always understood the importance of workers and the central role they play in our economy. Workers always been essential to us. And we don't think lip service to workers is any substitute for policies that actually support them either. This pandemic has shown the importance of having a government that invests in building up a nation. A government visionary enough to consider the short, medium, and long-term effects of their policies. It was the PLP that understood what job losses does to families. And so it was the PLP that implemented NIB. It was the PLP that understood the importance of foreign reserves and the value of the Bahamian dollar. So it was the PLP that created the central bank. It was the PLP that believed in the importance of education. And so it was the PLP that made it a policy for every child to have the opportunity to learn all the way to tertiary education and brought COB, which has been transformed to University of the Bahamas. It was the PLP that understood many Bahamians don't have the means necessary to repair their homes after a major hurricane. And so it was the PLP that brought about urban renewal home repairs. It was the PLP that understood the importance of food security. And so it was the PLP that created BAMSI. The Bahamian people at this time and at all times needs a government that actually cares, not a government that pretends to care. The Bahamian people want a government that can manage crisis as they arise and think forward to the challenges of the future. Unfortunately, Madam President, after three torturous years, I fail to see any evidence that this administration is committed to our people or to the future of this country. And I am not convinced. And Madam President, and I am not convinced that this government has implemented one new policy or initiative that has helped Bahamian families. 
Madam President, the side office came into office proclaiming it was the people's time. Mm -hmm. But in their very first budget, they <clears throat> cut taxes for washing machines and airplane parts. I wonder which people were supposed to benefit from that. Maybe it's those PL people, they have committed themselves to the wealthy 1%. But I remind the Bahamian public that all budgets are about choices. And the choices made by the Minnis administration have their gross incompetence, political favoritism, and lack of compassion written all over them. Madam President, this is a make-believe budget. It is unrealistic at best. In many ways, the 2020-21 budget reflects this administration and its leadership. It is filled with contradictions and I believe presents as facts some outright falsehoods. In my opinion, it recklessly deviates from the standards of fiscal prudence, much like this administration has deviated from the standards of good governance. Just like this administration will soon be rejected by the people, I believe this budget has been rejected by the government's lenders. Madam President, the Minister of Finance indicated this year's fiscal deficit would be the highest in history at $1.327 billion. The very next day, the Prime Minister announced that the government has been forced to convert a government guaranteed facility to a government obligation. This conversion therefore adds another 246 million to the deficit. Madam President, I find it strange that while the Minister of Finance was trying to convince a very skeptical public about his budget, the following day at a press conference, 28th of May, the Prime Minister was introducing a resolution to assume more debt and increase the projected deficit from 11.1% of GDP to 13.3% of GDP. This means that the budget presented on the 27th of May was no more than a manipulation of fiscal data. And I believe this may be why numerous forest and for foreign and domestic lenders do not consider this administration to be credible. The government by resolution is to borrow money from the same lenders of BPL to retire BPL debt. And I do not see this transaction reflected in the budget. Therefore, I say this government has misled the pu public and the government's lenders about the country's fiscal position. And this is a serious matter. Uh, Madam President. You said we misled. A, is this a point of order? It is a point of order. No, I ask what he It is a it is a it is a point It is a point of order. Um the the first of all there's no misleading of anybody by the government of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. It was yes, it was explicitly stated in respect of the conversion of BPL's um, um, paper loan of 241 million, uh, two, two loans roughly, one is a basket mm -hmm. and one is a separate loan, and the government assuming that liability, that this is predicated on the, the, uh, the fact that due to the negotiations and the complexities of the rate reduction bond, and I know because I've been intimately and deeply involved with my senior staff in assisting in both the negotiations and in the drawing up of the documents, and the legalities and the legal issues. And because of these legal technicalities and the very special and precise nature of the bond offering and the requirements of it, we were unable the, the market was unable and the lawyers and the banks were unable to proceed with the matter in the, at the time we wished and in sufficient time to place the bond into the international markets in order to in order for BPL to be able to pay the loan. The loan came is coming due and therefore it had to be taken over by the government as a short-term measure and this was all explained to the Bahamian people. There is no misleading of anything and as soon as the rate reduction bond is paid, um, uh, a portion of it will go to 
paying off the government for the loan it is uh, assumed in this budget. And so in other words, it'll be a wash. It will be a wash. And there was no deception of anybody. We are doing what we have to do to I save the I didn't say BPL. deception. Yeah. Thank you. And I hope, I hope that the government intends to follow the financial administration and audit act in this matter and table a supplementary budget, supplementary budget to accompany this resolution. Madam President, just three years ago, this administration inherited a fiscal situation that was in great contrast to the one which the PLP administration inherited in 2012. The fact which was implemented at a low rate and after wide consultation was performing well. We had also embarked on the most ambitious revenue enhancement efforts in the history of the Bahamas. The structural deficit inherited by the PLP administration, which was estimated to be about 3% of GDP, was eliminated. The government had implemented a program of tax reductions to coincide with administrative improvements in customs business license and real property tax. Notwithstanding the impact of Math Hurricane Matthew, which led to a 3% of GDP increase in overall expenditure and a 2% of GDP decrease in overall revenue, the country was well positioned fiscally, especially considering the full opening of the Bama Resort. And let's not forget that for the fiscal year 2016-2017, the last year of the PLP administration, the deficit was on track to be less than 1% of the GDP had it not been for Hurricane Matthew. However, Madam President, this government has talked and talked and talked and talked some more about how the budget re before us reflects disasters of Hurricane Dorian and COVID-19. But the truth is very important. And the truth is, this government would have been in a very tight spot, even without two disasters. They, the only thing that can be said about this government is that they have turned two disasters into a, one enormous nationwide crisis. Let us examine what is, I mean by this. The deficit of 1.3 billion is the highest ever recorded. Even though the Minister of Finance told us again and again that nothing matters more to them than managing the deficit. At the same time, the debt increased from 8.2 billion to 9.5 billion between 2019 and 2020. In fact, the three year tenure of this government has shown an increase in the debt and there is no tangible evidence as to how this massive increase in borrowing has been applied. Ask around. You can't find Bahamians who can tell you they feel the impact of all the money they've borrowed. And worse is coming. They are forecasting the GDP will decline by 11.6% which mean there will be a negative economic growth. The anticipated GDP might even be worse than they're admitting, depending on the external environment. In particular, the pace at which the United States economy will rebound. Revenues will decline from 2.4 billion to 1.76 billion, a reduction of some 29%. And this does not factor the tax giveaways that the government has announced. Madam President, if Hurricane Dorian and COVID-19 are the pretext for the present fiscal situation, I find it puzzling that the level of expenditure on the recurrent side remains the same at 2.5 billion. Surely, if the government is serious about meeting this moment and really helping Bahamians, then the expenditure figure is much too low. I predict, therefore, that the pressures on the recurrent expenditure side will force this government to come back to this house to borrow more in order to address the problems which they will encounter in dealing with these disasters. I foreshadow three areas which will be impacted, which will require 
higher recurring expenditure, and these will be health care delivery, education, and social services. There is no way that there can be any meaningful action in these three areas based on the present levels of recurrent expenditure. Their failure to anticipate that they will need to spend more to help Bahamian families shows that this government is neither competent nor compassionate. Madam President, I am sorry to say that the incompetence of the FNM is on display throughout this budget. There are no innovative solutions in this budget. In place of real help, they offer bandage and rhetoric. The budget reads like a confession. We, the FNM, don't know how to tackle the problems that face our nation. This is a watershed moment to which we will forever point. The moment our nation was sent into deep and treacherous waters. Madam President, I consider this tragic. This government has missed an opportunity to build something new and transformative. Where are the youth empowerment initiatives and the encouragement of light industry on a larger scale? And I agree with Senator Darius, more is needed in terms of initiatives and policies around female empowerment in the continued fight for equal treatment. Only thing I agree with. <laughs> Madam President, I heard statements about access to funding and increase in financial support for SMEs. But in the new normal, can we have policies that go further than the economic free trade zones and focus on building orange economies that promote arts and crafts unique to different Bahamian communities and family islands. Madam President, we have the opportunity in front of us to encourage Lincoln agriculture and fisheries to tourism, laying the foundation for cottage ind industries and sustainable and subsistence farming. I further ask, what has happened to the over the hill initiatives? Is the Family Island Development Act defunct? Madam President, it is unfortunate that prior to the crisis, this government did not see the importance in strengthening institutions and developing health services with a view to advancing the implementation of NHI. The stop, review, and cancel practices of the FNM delay development and deprived communities and taxpayers of needed infrastructure. Importantly, the government's stopping of substantial improvements in the social service system was laid bare during this pandemic and underscored their careless disregard for the well-being of the less fortunate. Because stop, review, and cancel has always been about politics and not about people. And Madam President, the concerns I have about the lack of competence and compassion are shared not just by my colleagues in the PLP, but by the government's own colleagues too. Listen to these comments. Following the burial of 55 unidentified Hurricane Dorian victims after nearly nine months. The Member of Parliament for Central and South Abaco asked for a formal inquiry into what went wrong, saying in a letter to the Prime Minister, Sir, I feel a review of this is not only imperative for the families of Abaco, but also for the proper handling of any future mass casualty events. God forbid. The Member of St. Anne's said, I think if I can give my two cents of advice to a large extent, the public <laughs> are getting, yeah, yeah, he got more than two cents, yeah. but he's giving his two cents to them, yeah, his yeah, government. Gosh, the public are getting tired of hearing of extraordinary events or uncharted or unprecedented or whatever. No more excuses. The Member of Parliament for Central and South Elutra asks, why are we treating family islanders the way we are treating them? Mm -hmm. Family islanders are Bahamians as well. No matter what island, they deserve to be treated with the same respect and dignity as anywhere else in this country. Okay. Madam President, the Disaster Authority it's supposed to help with disasters, not be a disaster itself. And when I took part in a debate 
about this authority. I spoke out against the management of Hurricane Dorian and how careless this government had been in creating more bureaucratic systems as opposed to providing the necessary relief. At the time, my words were faced with strong opposition from the governing side. And lo and behold, just 10 months later, the former Minister of Health stated in his budget debate, mm, mm. as of today, we don't know collectively who is lost, missing, or missing and presumed dead. I fear that we have not sufficiently elevated this matter as a national priority. There was too little focused attention on management of the issue of missing and deceased persons. This is the part I like, Senator Sweden. He said responsibility was spread over multiple ministries and government agencies. It was believed that this would ensure greater clarity. In action, it proved to be a recipe for disaster. Madam President, this is the government's colleagues who are speaking loud and clear on the inefficiencies, on the incompetence, the negligence, and the mistakes of their f and administration. So even if they didn't want to take my word for it, or the word of the people, I say, listen to your colleagues. They are telling you just as well that you are about to go over a cliff. Listen to them if you won't listen to the Bahamian people. Madam President, we don't just have a fiscal deficit to deal with in this country. We have a compassion deficit too. A prime minister who wanted to answer the questions of the people would not run from the media. A minister of finance who cared about the people will not boast about layoffs of Bahamians from the public sector as an accomplishment, even though Bahamians have come to expect so little from this government, I think we were still all shocked when the Prime Minister failed to join grieving families as they lay their loved ones to rest during a national service. Madam President, this government has a funny idea of compassion. They want praise for unemployment benefits as if these are some big gifts from the government to the people. But unemployment benefits are the people's money being returned to them. Unemployment benefits come from the contributions deducted from the hard-earned wages of Bahamians. Through three difficult years and through stumbles and missteps and errors, we have learned a lot about this f and government. This f and government has shown the Bahamian people precisely who they are, who they listen to, and who they work on behalf of. And it most certainly has not been the Bahamian people. And quite frankly, Madam President, the reality on the ground is different from the songs the f and sings in support of their budget. This economy works well for powerful friends of great wealth to the f and On the other hand, the middle class and the lower income families have found themselves worse off because of their policies. Day by day, more and more Bahamians watch their entire life savings slip away, and thousands are fighting to stay above the poverty line. And for the past three years, we have seen the Minister administration make decisions against the interests of the majority while banging on the table. And like the young people say, slapping up about it's the people's time with no shame while hardworking behemoths are barely surviving. Madam President, the biggest moral tragedy that exists today is that Bahamian people do not have a government that they can turn to in their greatest time of need. Budgets reflect a government's priority. We need no further evidence to conclude that this is not the Bahamian people's time. This government has said loudly which people are their priority. If you don't believe me, ask the people in Abaco and ask the people in Grand Bahama. This government borrowed three billion in three years and all the people would like to know is where did the money go? Like the Bahamian people say, where the money gone? 
So while this side opposite pat themselves on the back and speak about how much of a good job they have done, there is a real truth outside of these chambers. People are hurting because of this administration's lack of compassion, gross incompetence, and their favoritism to always choose special interests over the majority of Bahamians. Madam President, listening to the people's ideas and worries, their hopes and their fears has given me an even deeper insight into what a better future might look like for our country with the right leader. These encounters are a potent reminder of why I first joined the Progressive Liberal Party. And today I express renewed confidence in my belief that our party's ideology, values, and beliefs are central to the Bahamian dream. May God continue to bless the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. I just like to ask a question before, um, if I may, of the last speaker. Before, yeah, yeah. Oh, I didn't want to. I did not wish to. I did not wish to interrupt her. Speech. Senator Bosworth. She was so far. It may be could, recognized. Could please. you yeah. just one second for me, please? Yeah. Yes, yes, Madam President. Yeah, the, the uh, last the speaker, Senator Kobe. Senator thank you, Senator <coughs> Kobe Davis, made a statement that the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance was celebrating um, um, or, 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 or congratulating himself on. Uh, uh, the dismissal of public servants. Uh, please uh, provide uh, exactly the quote, time and circumstances where that happened because I, I, I specifically deny that. We have done everything that we could do to maintain public service employment. Okay, and so I would ask you to withdraw that term, that, that phrase or that allegation against the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance or prove it. Yes, 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 yeah. Austerity, no, no, where, where, I, did, I will, he, I will where prove did he, it. where did he congratulate himself on firing uh, public servants? Okay, fine. I, I call on you to, you know, if, let me say something. You know, it is extremely unfortunate that a speaker in this place would get up and make a, a an aspersion against um, um, a government official and not have the, 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 the wherewithal to justify making that aspersion at the moment that they are challenged on it. This is very unparliamentary. Okay? It's extreme. I would call on her, Madam, Madam President, if she can't stand up here now and, and give a direct quotation and say where she got the quote from, I would ask that we don't we don't have a hand side, but those words be stricken from the record so that no one listening and no press listening can carry that foolishness. My question um, to Senator Davis, a question has been asked. Are you able willing, able, and ready to justify the, your, the statement that was made? Madam President, thank you. I wasn't quoting the minister. I referred to the austerity measures that no, he no, no, called no, no, as an accomplishment. No, 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 no. You said it. You did say that. I didn't quote. I didn't say quote. It doesn't matter. You said he was celebrating. You need to withdraw. He celebrated the austerity measures as an accomplishment. And what part of the austerity measures caused public servants to be fired from their jobs? That doesn't cause anybody to be fired. We have preserved public Public service employment. We have preserved uh, public service employment. Simply not true. You know that's true. If, if, the, if, the, no, if the, Madam President, if the presiding officer yes. feels that this member has crossed the line, then strike it from the record. 
Okay. But there's no cause for her to withdraw it. There's no cause for her to withdraw it. Then I'd say it is the line of unparliamentary conduct. And you as the leader should not be encouraging your members to engage in unparliamentary conduct. Don't come with that. Don't come with that. You know, get on your high horse with nonsense. You get on. You get, stop twisting the rules to do foolishness. Nonsense today, man. Not you are today. twisting the rules not today, to do foolishness. Not today. Okay. You not stop today. it. Not today. One, one second, please, Senator Mitchell. If the statement made, if if the senator is willing and able to confirm the statement that was made, then it she needs to be it. done now. And if she can't, if she you can't then I would strongly recommend that that statement be withdrawn. Madam President, I'm looking at an article, May 30th, 2018. Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, Peter Turnquist, just said moments ago that as a result of a 10% budget cut in all government ministries, it has resulted in government wage bill decreasing by 120 million. Can the minute, the AG confirm whether the 10% cut included so included firings so at the public office? No, Austerity measures included not. public servants were fired. Public servants were fired. They were let go. You lied. No, you know public servants were let go. Public servants were let go. You all got up on the record. Listen, she can speak for herself. No, 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 sir. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. Public servants were let go when this government came to office. It is true. President, it's about streamlining the budget for all government agencies. Okay. Sorry. The uh, senator indicates that she has found information to validate her comment. And she said public servants were let That's go. That's not so. That's not so. It's not. Then please give us some idea of the public servants in what ministry that these public servants will let go. It's a comment. It's a comment. It's a fair comment. It's a fair comment. Come on. It's, it's a fair comment. It's a fair comment. You can strike it from the record. That's, you know, fine. No problem. You know. <laughs> okay. In view of the fact that we cannot seem to get a consensus as to who can prove what, we will strike those comments from the record. Thank you very much. There's one, uh, there's a point uh, of uh, clarification to respond that I must respond to uh, another point made by um, the senator opposite, Senator Kobe Davis, who obviously does not understand budgeting. Come on now! Come on! Don't, come come on. don't, don't, don't start don't with that with foolishness. Just don't don't be trying to be insulting. If you have a question or don't comment, come make it to me. Don't, don't try and be insulting. Because no one it. insults yeah. anyone on your Robert, side. Robert, and I expect an apology I'll from that comment. That's what I expect. An apology. No, this is nonsense. Say what you got to say. If you have a question or comment, say it. But don't insult me because I don't insult you. What? What? I young don't lady, her. young lady, what is this? You just That's insulted me on what record. Is don't what is this? You just me, insulted Senator. me on oh, record. Come on. You insulted my insults. You're being sexist. You don't understand budget. You're being Thank sexist. You. That's what you're doing. Oh, come on. You're being sexist. No, 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 no. I'm not being sexist. Just talk about women and you're being sexist, right? You're being sexist now. That's what you're doing. Senator Mitchell. I told you about that yesterday. Senator Mitchell, please take your seat. I have asked the comment was Senator made. Bethel to rephrase or oh, I, 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 I withdrew the, the comment, comment that, that was that made. She doesn't understand budgeting, but I would have to point out that um, there's no supplementary bill required um, to deal just with point that out. to deal yeah. with the assumption of the BPL debt on the short-term basis on which we propose to do so because it is all captured within the existing appropriation it is all accounted for within the existing appropriation and the, the resolution to do so complies with the requirements in the financial administration and audit act and so there is no need and will be no need for us to come back to this house in compliance with the financial administration and audit act to approve anything else 
files. All that is required to do this in the context of the budget is, has already been done. Thank you. Thank you. I did not say a year, but no words in my The chair recognizes Senator Boswick Dean. Good morning. This afternoon. You all living a good life this afternoon. <laughs> and the people of the Bahamas, and to speak to the budget of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas for the first time. My colleagues, these are surely biblical times. All around the world, there are the signs of the times. Plagues and locusts are actually ravaging parts of the continent of Africa as we speak. They are stripping the land of all vegetation, leading to predictions of famine. We watched what appeared to be the continent of Australia burn last fall. Heat waves in the Arctic Circle, it was 100 degrees Fahrenheit on Monday in some parts in the Arctic Circle. First named storm of this year's hurricane season in May and forming over the Bahamas. My people, the first named storm already in May. Prepare, prepare and we pray to God that we will be spared the ravages of any storm this season. We pray God for your mercy. Indeed, so-called storms of the century are now the order of the day. These are the times my grandmother talked about. We have heard it being said that these are historic times and the Bahamas is not immune. We seem to be getting more than our share. It has been repeatedly stated, but it, get, gains, it bears repeating again that almost 10 months ago, the Bahamas, Grand Bahamas and Abaco, our second and third largest economies endured the savagery of Hurricane Dorian. And now we, along with the entire world, are in the grip of the coronavirus. These two epic events have wreaked havoc on our economy, our way of life, and our psyche. There is no minimizing or politicizing this. Those are the facts. And I dare to say, no matter how tired anyone on the FNM or PLP side may be getting of hearing it, yes. those are the facts, yes. and that is the reality we are forced to deal with. Right. Our second and third largest economies were essentially destroyed by Hurricane Dorian in September 2019. And before they and the country could begin to recover economically, and before we the people, as a people, could recover psychologically from the trauma and horror of the hurricane. Six months later, the economy of the entire Bahamas, and indeed the world, had to be put to sleep in an attempt to stop the spread of the coronavirus. As a result of my being high risk due to an asthmatic condition, this is my first time back in these precincts since the first emergency orders. I therefore take this moment to thank the members of the COVID response team, led by the Prime Minister, the former Minister of Health, Dr. Dow Regis, all doctors, nurses, emergency response personnel, health administrators, health sanitation workers, and everyone else in the health service industry that contributed to the successful management of the COVID crisis. I thank God for their leadership, stewardship, and bravery as they managed the front line while we sheltered in place. Yes, yes, yes. We most surely were and are blessed that we had and have Dr. Merceline Dow Regis to lead the team and to act as the special advisor to the Prime Minister and the Minister of, and the then Minister of Health. Dr. Dow Regis is eminently qualified to lead our response to the virus due to her regional experience in dealing with other infectious diseases. Mm -hmm. In 2010, Dr. Dow Regis was appointed to lead PAHO's International Expert Committee for Verification of the Elimination of Measles, Rubella, and Congenital Rubella Syndrome. Mm -hmm. She is the first Bahamian, male or female, 
to receive the prestigious Pan American Health Organization's Public Health Hero Award of the Americas. On the presentation of the award, Dr. Carissa E. Etienne, who was then a director of PAHO, said she's just the second Caribbean national and the first Caribbean woman to receive this prestigious award. She is a regional expert with global recognition. Dr. Dal Regis, we, the people of the Bahamas, we thank you for your service and your stewardship. We are and we're blessed that our Prime Minister is a doctor, and his former Minister of Health is also a renowned doctor. We have at our helm men who were trained to understand the threat that we and the world faced, and in so doing, they did not hesitate to take the necessary difficult steps, as advised by Dr. Dal Regis and her team, well ahead of other developed nations. These steps ensured that our health system was not overwhelmed with citizens suffering from the COVID virus, many of whom are likely to die if they contract the virus, as we have the third highest rate of obesity in the world, and many of our people are diabetics and suffer from high blood pressure. Indeed, all of the comorbidities that put people at risk of dying in the Bahamas are very prevalent in the Bahamas. We were and we are ahead of most of the world when dealing with this pandemic. For example, our team made it mandatory to wear masks in public more than a month ago. But in other nations, including our great neighbor to the north, they still have not gotten to the point of making it mandatory, even though it is now established and accepted that wearing masks slows and or diminishes the spread of the virus. These leading doctors were supported by a team of doctors and other medical professionals. I wish to specially recognize Dr. Nakia Forbes, who came out in front initially and adeptly answered wide-ranging questions, speaking to the fears of the nation, nation in a factual and yet comforting manner. She was powerful and she was comforting. And while I thank all persons that assisted in our response, I could not help but notice that when the COVID task force would take the stage during press conferences, that it was a team comprised of women. Wow. Oh, cool. That's cool. This. That might explain why we did so well with our response. <laughs> Women leaders all around the world, yeah. Chancellor Merkel in Germany, Prime Minister Jacob Dottier of Iceland, Prime Minister Ardeen in New Zealand, Prime Minister or President Ingwen of Taiwan, and Prime Minister Marin in Finland, who is the youngest Prime Minister who incidentally governs with a coalition of four female-led parties. They all had better results controlling the spread of the coronavirus than their male counterparts. We thank God that our Prime Minister and the former Minister of Health had the wisdom to accept the wise counsel of women. Yes. Like you said, my sister, no, more of us need to come to the front. Now, if only <laughs> can we get, we can have ours soon, yeah. Mr. Mitchell, I assure you. Yeah. Now, if we can only get all of our men to believe in the leadership of women and to vote and to believe in us and to vote for us to have equal rights under the Constitution. All right, all right. But that is for another day and another debate. Suffice it to say, at this time, that when it comes to our COVID response, we have the A-team. Yes. We are in good hands, and that is evident from the fact that we never experienced a surge and our hospitals were never overwhelmed by COVID patients. It is clear that it is very likely that we would have had a very different outcome if the opposition was at the helm. 
While the government appointed an expert team and followed and continued to follow their advice, the leader of the opposition was out trying to steal, steal headlines on March 20th, 2020, yeah. stating that the government's response was overreaching. He, a lawyer like me, sought to question the medical opinion and advice of the first-class doctors, including our Prime Minister and his then Minister of Health, leading our response. For goodness sakes, even our Prime Minister, a former OBGYN, and our former Minister of Health, Dr. Sands, a renowned surgeon, recognized that this was not their area of expertise and put together a team comprised of infectious disease specialists from whom they took advice. But yet our leader of the opposition or the leader of the opposition would say, when you take your, their advice, you're overreaching. The government's response under the opposition's leadership during this crisis would have been disastrous if the leader of the opposition could not see the need to accept the medical advice of our professionals in the field. Proverbs chapter 12 verse 15 states, a wise man listens to advice. Yes, yes, yes. Our prime minister has demonstrated that he is certainly a wise man. You can check the rest of Proverbs chapter 12 verse 15 to see what it says about the man that fails to listen to advice. In any event, as I was saying, our second and third largest economies were essentially destroyed by Hurricane Dorian in September 2019. And before our people and the country could recover economically and psychologically from the trauma and horror, six months later, the economy of the entire Bahamas, and indeed the world, had to be put to sleep in an attempt to stop the spread of the virus. The full impact of the countries of the world effectively, simultaneously putting their economies to sleep is not yet known. It has never been done before. So I can only smile when I hear our colleague, Senator Joe Beth Colby, say that all governments face hardship. There's nothing unusual. But this which we are going through we has never, the world has never, ever seen it before. No government anywhere in this world has ever dealt with what we are going through. And I dare to say, when Dorian sat over us, that beast for as long as it did, the world covered it because guess what? It had never, ever been seen before. You cannot stand here in this place and try to compare anything that has gone before to what has transpired in the Bahamas over the last 12, 10 months. <laughs> what we do now is the immediate effect what we do know, pardon me, is that the immediate effect has been worldwide unemployment, resulting in worldwide social ills, including hunger, potential homelessness, spiraling personal and business debts, and domestic violence against women, young people, and children. The Bahamas was not spared from these effects. Indeed, as 50% of our GDP is derived from tourism, the impact of shutting down the economy has touched each and every citizen's financial well-being and security. Just as in other countries in the world, for the first time, persons who have never had to seek social assistance and never dreamed that they would need to rely upon unemployment benefits must now do so. And while we seek to now reawaken the economy, it is quite possible that as it stumbles out of its hibernation, even more persons will have to rely upon some form of assistance from the government in order to make it through these times. It is without question that there are difficult days ahead. None of these events are of the government's, make, government's making, but it is up to the nation's leader, leaders to respond to each crisis to steady our course and to set, steer us to safe harbor. Trying times like these call for drastic measures. This is no time to cut spending. 
Indeed, this is when the government must, must spend in order to keep the economy moving. The government must move ahead with capital expenditure projects, such as the central bank, the new court building, and the new airports and clinics, which we've heard about since we've been here, so as to employ persons on construction sites so that they can feed and provide for their families. In order to spend, as the government must now do at this time, in order to save the economy, we have no choice but to borrow. Now, I would have heard, and this is the, the PLP stick at this time, and I, I would just say that Ms. Colby Davis, Senator Colby Davis would have just beat the stick, which is their stick at this time, to again harp on this issue of the FNM has borrowed $3 billion over the th term in the off their term thus far in the office, this current FNM administration. But my sister, Senator Isaac Dotson, had already addressed this in her presentation. I understand that nonetheless, our colleague must continue to beat the stick. But for those of you that would have missed Senator Isaac Dotson, let me just repeat what Isaac Dotson would have said when she would have indicated in this place that the Minister of Tourism and Aviation, the Honorable Dionzio Di Aguilar, in his budget debate on June 17, 2020, put the borrowing misconception to rest by succinctly stating, quote, what the PLP would have you believe is that we borrowed three billion and our national debt, debt went up by three billion. But that is not what the numbers reveal. What they reveal, Mr. Speaker, is that we borrowed $3 billion, but our national debt only went up by $1 billion. My people, listen to what is being said to you, and don't just consume political rhetoric being spewed out by the opposition. Listen to the facts. Go and get the facts. Not only that, my people, the Minister of Finance unprecedented in this country before. You can go to the ministry site, you can read the budget, all of our speeches can be accessed. Not only that, we are passing legislation so that there are regular reports to parliament. And this PLP government would sit, or PLP opposition, would sit down and constantly seek to just befuddle you and confuse you and muddy up the waters. Well, guess what? You don't have to tolerate it. Just go online and check it yourself. Don't listen to me. Check it yourself. But Dionzio Diagola went on and said, Minister Denisio Diagola went on to say, what they reveal, that is the numbers, Mr. Speaker, is that we borrowed three billion, but our national debt only went up by one billion. Why, Mr. Speaker, did we borrow three billion, as the PLP say, but our total debt only went up by one billion? I'm gonna pause there. The PLP would have to ask that question because they wouldn't understand about fiscal management. If they borrow it, they don't realize you gotta pay it back. So if we borrow three, it went up by three. We're confused, why didn't it go up by three? Because we paid back debt. It's not confusing. Don't let them muddy you up and confuse you. It's not confusing, that's basic, simple math. You borrow it, you pay some back, it goes down. That's right. Hello. <laughs> you know? So they're confused. But, well, that is because of the three billion. Here goes Diagola saying just what I just said to you. Well, that is because of the three billion that we borrowed, we paid off two billion of existing debt and added a billion of this borrowing to the national debt. Simple, simple mathematics. He went on to say, we understand that our borrowings will be more than the PLP. We get that. But remember that the borrowings of the PLP were reduced by 1.5 billion in additional VAT money. And remember this too, think on this. In the one year that we did not have a hurricane or a pandemic, 2018 to 2019, we, this FNM government, we demonstrated to the Bahamian people that we managed their money effectively and responsibly and reduced the deficit to $219 million. 
And yeah, we keep saying it because my people, you need to hear it. And I'm gonna tell you why you need to hear it a little later when I quote Mr. Cooper. I'm gonna tell you why, because of the games that they play in this political manipulation. I'm gonna repeat it. When we did that, that was the lowest deficit in a decade. I'm gonna repeat it again. That was the lowest deficit in a decade. That includes the last five years of their term. So when we look, despite any statements to the contrary from the opposition during this budget debate, they know and support the basic principle that we have to borrow in these current circumstances. Yes. Yes. Indeed, in their plan for, in their quote, plan for mitigation of coronavirus economic fallout, this is their plan. I'm just providing it to let them know I have it here with me yeah. before any questions come and arise. But this is their plan. Yeah. So everything I'm about to quote comes out of their PLP plan. Yeah. You can find it on their site. Yeah. So hopefully I don't have to get interrupted to be said when I say, and I quote, where I get it from. I could, t I could tell you the page, chapter, and verse. Okay? So, indeed, in their plan for the mitigation of coronavirus economic fallout, published on or about April 10, 2020, by their shadow minister of finance and deputy leader of the opposition party, Mr. Chester Cooper, they estimated, quote, that unemployment will exceed 30%. And the deficit for the fiscal year 2021 will easily exceed 1 billion when all the numbers are finalized. Unquote. And they forecasted, quote, that 1 billion to 2 billion in funding is required to keep the economy afloat. They knew we would have to borrow this money. They knew this by their own forecast. Mr. Cooper also indicated that they are confident, quote, sorry, are confident that the notion, if it exists, that things will go back to normal immediately as soon as physical distancing is over is misguided. That's the opposition position. But Mr. Cooper then went on to say, and I quote, understandably, people are heavily stressed. Now, I told you I can tell you why they play the games they play. This is how they try to mess with our emotions, yeah. our psyche, at a time when we as a people are under tremendous load from all of what we have been enduring for the last 10 months. This isn't a game, this is people's lives. But here we go, Mr. Cooper. Understandably, people are heavily stressed and have great misgivings about the national debt and will be mistrustful of the potential significant spending. So the opposition is fully aware that the people are heavily stressed. The opposition is fully aware that the people have great misgivings about the national debt. That is to say that the opposition is aware that in these times the people have doubts. They have worries and they have fears. That's what misgivings means. And the opposition know that the people are mistrustful. Right there. That's what they're capitalizing on. Mistrustful of the potential significant spending, end quote. The potential significant spending, which they know we have to do. But they know we're mistrustful about it. So they go into work on us and on y'all. They go into work and capitalizing on that mistrust that they've identified in us. That is to say, they know that the op they know that the people are distrustful, suspicious, and skeptical about government expenditure. And they've known this since they published their plan on or about April 10, 2020. They have, and yet, they have sat back. Forgive me, not quite. They didn't quite sit back. No, they called the media. They called the media to record them giving out a few bags of groceries emblazoned with PLP stickers. 
They called them to say, look, we're going into the constituencies with some groceries. And then they sat back and waited for this moment to capitalize on the people's stress, misgiving, and trust. I hear a lot of noise down there, but trust me, if they had done a lot more, we would have known it. Because they know how to call the camera, and it would have been on their site. You all see anything else? Did you see anything else? The answer is no, because that's what they've done in this pandemic. That's what they've done. So that's what they did. They sat back. They waited, they gave out a couple of bags, made sure whoever got it, know it come from the PLP. Listen, those of you in the in, out there who would have seen our members of parliament, y'all would know that our members of parliament were on the street all hours of the day, every day. Lockdown, no lockdown. Weekend, no weekend. Holiday, no holiday. And they were out there giving out food to people. But guess what? They didn't ask, come tribute, come look. They didn't picture, get the picture. Get the picture of me giving Miss Jones over there of a bag of food. Yeah. She's destitute and needy. Put her all over the internet. See her there? She need this bag of food. No, we treated you with dignity. Wow. So, and they waited. And now, here we go. This is their moment. But you see, this, this, this is to me just despicable. This same attitude was exhibited again t this morning when Senator Colby Davis spoke. Because as she wanted to score political points to say what the former Minister of Health had to say in the House of Parliament, she read about how the, and, and these things are serious. These things are hurting our people. What he is saying about the missing, you know? And here she goes while she's trying to, she can't even hold on to that grief. And the horror of that moment loud enough to restrain herself and say, and this the part I like. <laughs> yeah. This the part I like. I it's about the politics. Yes. This the part you like. There's no part of talking about the missing people and the suffering and the grief that you could like. Yeah. There's no part of it. But you see, they can't restrain it. Where? Where? <laughs> This noise that is being heard over on the other side, this noise, you'll realize how politically motivated it is if you take the time to read Cooper's plan. Because if you take the plan to read that plan, it is essentially one and the same as what must be done. And it's actually not rocket science what we have to do, you know. We have to help our people in need. We have to keep our businesses going. And we have to do plenty of prayer. Yes. Plenty praying because we got to turn this ship in the midst of a crisis. That's right. That's right. So they are almost of one accord. But yet, the opposition seeks to capitalize on these difficult times for political gain. I encourage them to work together as one. My God, if there was never a time, the time is now. Work together. Many of them have come and said, I appreciate so-and-so coming and saying, let's work together as a team. I appreciate so-and-so coming and saying, let's work together as a team. And then they sit right down here and instead of saying whatever they got to say here about what needs to be done, instead of saying it to their parliamentary colleagues, their fellow Bahamians, the representatives of the people to get the job done, they come in here and they, let me stick you here and stick you there. This ain't the time. No. This ain't the time. Anyway, you wonder what you're talking about when it hurts. Yes. You're feeling what I say, and that's why you want to know what I say. If it didn't hurt, you wouldn't worry about what about it. <laughs> Having recognized from April 10th where my people are, by way of any and all of their utterances to the country, the opposition has shown and proven that they are nothing more than political opportunists who are prepared to prey on the stresses and fears of our people. After all, who can forget the leader of the opposition standing in the flooded street in Pinewood in a bright yellow raincoat? After the passage of Dorian, while we were searching for our loved ones, some of whom, as Dr. Sands has highlighted and has been mentioned here, 
we're still searching for. In the days after the storm, I was calling frantically family and friends in Grand Bahama. And we all know we couldn't get through because a lot of the network was down. Other people were trying to rescue people. We were trying to get food. I found my phone. I didn't even know who all had my phone number until the phone call started coming. And I found myself a coordinator of efforts to, this person is away and sending relief. Let me call Minister Pintard. Minister Pintard, can you get a plane on the ground? I'm trying to send relief. I'm trying to do this. And while you're doing that, can you, do you have any news on my family? That's the kind of thing people were doing. Ordinary citizens, every one of us were called into action. And yet, here comes a man in the yellow slicker walking in Pinewood would be no flood in a normal thunderstorm. Yeah. 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 You know? I mean, come on, man. Are we serious? Do you know how hurtful that is? And then they stand up and have the nerve to tell us and to tell you, we love y'all, we care about you. Man, come on, man. It, it, it really, you see, these things, people will come in here and they talk politics, but some of these things are in politics. It's serious. It ain't a joke. It's not a joke. How out of touch and how insensitive 2022 is not far away. If you turn around and vote them back in when they are in your face, playing on your stress, your anxiety, your worries and your fears, then as my six-year-old son's grade one teacher tells them, you will get what you get and don't be upset. Right. Y'all, there's a difference. I, you see, I've been in politics, not on the front, but I've been in politics my whole life. Yeah. Nothing offends me more than hearing somebody tell me there, there ain't no difference between the FM and the PLP. Ah, yeah. Look around you. If you see it look good and look pretty and built, guess who did that? Guess who built your beach? Guess who built your new call a name? Miss, I ain't got long enough. I ain't got long enough to list off, but I can deal with some of that when I come to your education that the great PLP did for us. What they actually pulled down from where they inherited it. We are here to tell you, my people, Stay focused. fear not, because in the midst of this health and economic crisis, and I'm gonna say it, and like Minister Thompson, I'm gonna say it and mean it. Yeah. This is the people's time. Yeah. And this is the people's budget. The Deputy Prime Minister came to Parliament and told the people the truth. It's going to be hard. There is going to be hardship. We are going to have to borrow a lot of money to assist people and to stabilize the economy. We are going to have to develop a new economy. We can pull ourselves out of this situation with focus and discipline. He presented a budget with five critical aims. One, protecting the health and safety of Bahamians. Two, providing adequate social support to vulnerable members of our community. Three, Sorry, sorry. Um, yes, um, we are approaching the one o'clock hour, um, but um, you are giving such a dynamic uh, presentation. We wish for you to continue, so I therefore uh, beg leave to move that the business of the Senate continue after 1 p.m. Thank you. Madam President, I rise to second that. To, to be clear, to be clear, we will, we do intend to, to uh, suspend after Senator Bosick is finished and uh, the next Senator has taken the stand uh, for one hour. Um, because it is the intent to finish all of these matters today and this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Five basic principles. Two, providing adequate social support to vulnerable members of our community. Oh, I thought he said he seconded me. Sorry. Yeah that the um, lunch break is, the business continues beyond one o'clock. And all those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? 
The ayes have it. Business will continue. Thank you. Two, providing adequate social support to vulnerable members of our community. Three, stabilizing the economy. Four, sustain, sustaining employment. And five, accelerating our government reforms. The biggest winners in this budget are the people. Yeah. It is a compassionate... Minister Thompson, I have 27 minutes and I got a lot more Say to go. Again. That's important. The biggest winners in the budget are the people. It is a compassionate and caring budget designed to try to ease some of the pain and suffering of our people caused by this corona crisis while stimulating the economy so as to stave off complete collapse. I use the word some. There is no government that can ease all of what is going on now. Here are some highlights from this people-centric budget. Food support. The government has allocated $25 million in the Department of Social Services budget for food support designed to reach more people for a longer period of time. The government created the National Food Distribution Task Force. They, in turn, have established a true partnership between the government and non-governmental organizations to feed our people during the COVID crisis. In addition, the $25 million allocated to the Department of Social Services, the government is funding 85% of the cost of the food being distributed through this partnership. This will be the single largest operation to feed the people of the Bahamas in its history. It covers all of the Bahamas. Indeed, on Monday, the Prime Minister announced, and I quote, since the formation of the Food Distribution Task Force, the government has injected $900,000, which has been used to assist more than 76,000 people. 5,054 units inclusive of food parcels or vouchers have been distributed. The program is scheduled to run for 12 weeks from June 1st to August 31st. The allegation in this regard is separate and apart from the allocation for the Ministry of Social Services food voucher program. Excuse me, please, one moment. <coughs> I assure you that's not COVID, my colleagues. I told you I suffer from asthma. <laughs> the DPM informed Parliament that the government has provided, quote, 17 million in increased social welfare spending to provide expanded food assistance through the government's food voucher initiative, as well as to support the expansion of other social programs at the Ministry of Social Services. The Unemployment Assistance Program. Now, before I go to my, prepar my prepared marks on this, let it just be noted. When my colleague, Senator Colby Davis, spoke, she would have spoken about how the PLP brought about NIB and it said that there would be no unemployment benefit but for them bringing about NIB. That is outright misleading. Oh. Madam President, I, I want to speak on a point of order. Okay. I would like the senator to not place words within my mouth. Either she can quote me directly or she can give a summary of how she feels it was said, but do not say that I made that comment because that is not a quote that came out of my, I said nothing about benefits and, and whatever. I said what the PLP did and either she can quote me or she can say how she felt about the position I held. Thank you. Madam President, in as much as... Um, one, one second, are you prepared to... Clarify. I'm going to speak to that. Okay. Madam President, in as much as um, the Senator has suggested that I misrepresented her, she is here, her speech is written, she was turning pages. In as much as we don't have a transcriber, please read back for us the section that you read. You, as I interpreted, Senator Colby, Colby Davis, 
she would have insinuated that the NIV. You, you can't say I would have insinuated. It, it is either your opinion of how you took it or either a quote directly from my speech. You cannot say I insinuated something. It, whatever you understood is how you understand it. But you still can't say I insinuated something. My understanding of what the senator said was that the POP, the, the fact that we have unemployment benefits is as a result of the PLP creating national insurance. That is incorrect. That is absolutely incorrect. It is correct to say that the PLP established the National Insurance Board. But the unemployment benefit was created by the Honorable, the former Prime Minister, the Honorable Hubert Alexander Ingram. I can, yeah. So, unemployment benefits, and in this current, in this current budget, we have provided unemployment benefits for tens of thousands of Bahamians, which has now been increased from 13 weeks to 26 weeks, and the creation by the government of a program to assist self-employed persons who would not normally be entitled to unemployment benefits. By mid-May, NIB paid out 6.2 million to assist self-employed persons and 28.8 million to assist those persons who were and are normally entitled to unemployment benefits. These payments covered just over 26,000 Bahamians since the end of March. The government has allocated another $48 million for continued unemployment assistance. When the senator says that all of the payments are coming out of the National Insurance Fund, that is incorrect. If we were to, if we were to take all of the money out of the fund. We would deplete the fund from its intended purpose. The fund actually, the, some of the monies are being allocated from the government consolidated fund and funded from that source. We have also provided a temporary incremental monthly increase of $50 in the old aid pension which is administered by NIB. In addition, we have made provision to support and grow small businesses. Payroll support through tax credit and deferral program has been introduced. Business continuity support through the Small Business Development Center. The government has budgeted another $55 million to support this project. It is designed to help businesses to stay open and to help them to keep their employees and to provide funding for new businesses arising out of the pandemic. The Prime Minister announced that to date, the Small Business Development Center has processed close to $36 million in business continuity loans and grants to 508 small businesses, allowing them to maintain some 3,900 employees on their payrolls. <clears throat> this kept those employees from becoming unemployed and kept those businesses which were likely to be able to acquire a loan from a commercial bank open. Education. Hmm. I am amazed that any PLP would seek to make education one of their strong points. not vain enough to be concerned about my age. I'm old enough to know better. What the good senator failed to say is that the PLP dismantled the government high school. They failed, and I should say, the government high school is a school that is responsible for 
educating and developing almost all of our nation's leaders, almost all. You see, I have a theory about why they did that, and I can share it briefly. They say it was because they wanted everybody to have equal, but I think really it was to ensure that the established leaders remained leaders. We're not keeping a school which develops leaders. I truly believe that. I truly believe that the PLPs are the authors of dissembling education in the Bahamas. During their time in education or in governance, it would be interesting to find out when they last built a school. Ah, they didn't do much of that. No, most of the new schools built were built during the terms of Hubert Alexander Ingram, and now this government in its current budget is planning to build more schools. And so they also moved a country with, it's uncomfortable to hear the facts, but the facts must be heard. And there are people here that are young enough not to know the facts that I speak of. People in this country. And the facts need to be heard in as much as the good senator would come to this place and seek to say, we are responsible for education. And they move the country with a more than 90% literacy to almost being illiterate to almost being illiterate. In any event, we allow the FNM is continuing its access to education program. The government has directed, quote, millions of additional resources towards free education for UBE and BVTI students. And we are continuing to fund the Universal Primary Education Initiative to make quality preschool education more inclusive and accessible. The allocation for the UB Scholarship Initiative has been increased by 1.5 million, and for BVTI, it has been increased by half a million dollars. That's what being concerned about education is, including the building of even more schools which they cannot talk of. That's why whenever they get loud, it's because it hurts. Just remember that, people. When you hear them getting loud, that's when it hurts. We also spoke to what was going on in agriculture. The government has made a lot of investments in agriculture. And the Minister of Agriculture and Marine Resources has spoken to the government's initiatives with agriculture. Health. The government has increased the allocations to the health sector to ensure its readiness for the detection, treatment, and mitigation of the virus by 20 million. Prior to this budget, the government has already spent 3.1 million to construct a new COVID-19 support unit at PMH and at the RAND and to put additional beds at the Grand Bahama Cancer Association for any overflow patients. However, as the Deputy Prime Minister said in his budget communication, the public threat is not behind us. Future public health emergencies could spring up at any time. We have to make sure that we are ready if they do. These funds, quote, will cover the cost for medical equipment and supplies, ensuring suitable quarantine facilities, amongst other things. The government is also increasing the allocation to the national health insurance by $18 million. And that that is something that was created by the PLP, and it has worked out well. Tax relief. In addition to the tax deferrals being offered to businesses so that they can keep their workers employed, the government is also giving tax reductions in targeted areas. For example, they have reduced duty on farming equipment for backyard farming. Some items to encourage adoption of environmentally friendly technologies and building materials. And they have removed duty on medical gloves and for a period of one year on personal protective equipment. They have expanded the tax relief on the transfer of land where there is no additional change in beneficial 
ownership. Yeah. They have also extended the tax relief granted to parts of the Grand Bahama and Abaco, and they have provided back to school, back holiday on school supplies, clothing, and select food items for the two weeks leading to the reopening of schools. Yeah. The government is increasing capital spending by $190 million for investments in hospitals and clinics, roadworks, and other civil projects across the Commonwealth to boost critical infrastructure and generate near-term job opportunities. This by no means is a full listing of all of the measures that the government intends to take in response to this new crisis as set out in the budget. This is just a few highlights. My colleagues in this place have named others. Yes. It is impossible for the government to provide the people and the economy with the sustenance which they now need and which we've explained in the budget while collecting less money without borrowing. Think about it, people. For example, we are not collecting hundreds of millions of dollars in taxes from tourist for landing fees, hotel room taxes, van on every item that they purchase. The government has granted concessions on the payment of taxes to businesses. That means they're not collecting that money so that they can stay open on the condition that they, com that they keep employees. And the government has extended all of the tax concessions to the residents of Grand Bahama and Abaco. So the government isn't collecting that money. I could go on and on, but the point is, is that if the government cannot collect money from various taxes, where is it going to get the money from to pay its normal operating expenses and for all the aid and benefits that, is, that it must and is now providing the people with? We are brothers and sisters. We are our brothers and sisters keepers. We have to borrow, at least until efforts to diversify the economy have taken root. And yes, Sometime in the future, we will pay the bill for looking after our brothers and sisters during these times. But that is what family does. Some people needing help have undoubtedly waited a long time to receive benefits which they have applied for. Again, while it may sound like a cliche, the fact is that systems which exist for distributing benefits were not created for such a significant increase in applicants at one time. Quite simply, just as in the developed world, and I'm thinking particularly of our neighbor to the north, where at one time the news reported that 10,000 people were on a food line in a major city, and also the United Kingdom, our social services and national insurance systems were overwhelmed by the need. It took time to work through the applications. Does that make it okay? No, it doesn't. But those are the facts. But we haven't sat back and just said, well, look at this mountain of paper. We don't know what to do with it. The Minister of Information Technology, Mr. Thompson, what Minister Thompson would have just explained to us the digitization of that process so that we can make it easier for people to obtain their relief. I won't repeat it here, but it is all there, and you can log on to the relevant sites. We have learned from the unprecedented events Recent hurricanes, Joaquin, Irma, Matthew, and Dorian have emphasized the need for us to prepare for hurricanes in a more comprehensive manner. Yes, yes. During the passage of Matthew, the Prime Minister also brought forth the concept and practice of evacuating islands in the path of a storm and moving the inhabitants to safety on another island outside of the path of a storm. And now, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us that we need to establish shelters so that we can evacuate those in harm's way to a safe house away from their abusers. Unfortunately and unavoidably, the lockdowns resulted in victims being locked down with their abusers. This impacted young people, women, and other marginalized members of our society. Candy Gibson of Foam and Felicity Carey of Teen Life Skills can tell the stories of riding out into the darkness of the lockdown street of Nassau, breaking curfew and navigating through roadblocks to go and extract victims of violence from homes that they were locked down in. Just like the Prime Minister, Candy Gibson evacuated those victims from their situations. Candy Gibson can tell of the difficulties in finding those women and children accommodation where they would be safe. The Women's Crisis Center was in full swing doing the same thing throughout this lockdown period. I myself on occasion had to call on the Women's Crisis Center to ask them, could they help 
and try to marry people with phone numbers and cell numbers, WhatsApp numbers, to contact the crisis center so that they could be evacuated from situations. This pandemic has shown us again that we need to establish safe houses for all who suffer abuse by reason of their gender. This government has taken on the care of tens of thousands of people by providing for their basic care. The government cannot possibly do everything at this time, especially when revenue collections is significantly challenged at this time, and where the government has granted numerous tax, tax relief concessions, which will further limit our financial resources. And so I take this opportunity to implore private citizens, churches, and corporations to consider the need for safe houses for those who are being subjected to violence and rape. We are our brothers and sisters keepers. I ask the government to implement the Gender-Based Violence Authority. And I ask them to have another review of legislation in order to bring relief in these areas. Bahamas, we shall rise. Yeah. We shall continue to be the jewel of the region. While each of us, the world, and more particularly our country, all face adversity, let us remember that as Albert Einstein said, adversity introduces a man to himself. I will tweak that to say that adversity will introduce our country to itself and to us. For too long, we have placed most of our eggs in the tourism and financial services baskets. For more than two decades, our financial services industry has been under relentless attack by the OECD. Over the last decades, there have been numerous town criers crying out that we needed to diversify our economy. Our financial service industry was steadily declining and we were courting potential disaster if there was ever a situation which caused tourists to stop coming to our shores. These cries grew, cries grew louder after 9-11, but still there was little done to diversify our economy. Indeed, instead of diversifying, I would posit that over the course of my lifetime, we actually contracted our economy. For example, we stopped producing eggs. Soyers no longer produces jams for the local market. And I miss my go of a jam. And within the last 10 or so years, all breeze that used to produce tin peas and pe for peas and rice and tomato paste closed down. The fact that we do not produce anything and are not capable of sustaining ourselves is compounded by the fact that in the, ver in the past, very little was done to decrease our imports. We buy almost everything that we consume. Yes. As the DPM noted in his communication, the Bahamas imports over 90% of what it consumes. In 2018, our total imports valued some $3.5 billion, the bulk of which was comprised of machinery and transportation equipment, food, and fuel. We produced almost nothing, and we are heavily dependent upon expensive fossil fuels to produce our energy at high cost. The high cost of energy is a bar to industry. Thankfully, this government is committed to converting to green energy and is actively implementing solar electricity. I am watching with great interest the implementation of the various solarization plans as there are significant opportunities for the government and our people out there in that industry. It has taken COVID to cause us to buckle at the knees as we are faced with the stark realization that we must diversify our economy and we must do so quickly, as quickly as possible. I want it to be noted that I said we have buckled at our knees. We are still standing. We are not on our knees and we are not bent over. We, while we welcome foreign direct investment into our economy, all foreign investors should take note. Please listen, Dr. Patrick Soon Xiong. The Bahamian people are not bent over. I think that I can say 
that all doors are open to proposals, but be reasonable in what you ask for. Indeed, everyone must come to their table with their reasonable proposals to diversify our economy. Black Bahamians, white Bahamians, Chinese Bahamians, Haitian Bahamians, men, women, rich, women, rich and poor, PLP, FNM, DNA, whosoever and wheresoever they may be, it must be all hands on deck. As Mahatma Gandhi said, strength does not come from winning. Your struggles develop your strength. When you go through hardships, you decide not to surrender. That is strength. My fellow Bahamians, we will never surrender. Never. Never. Yes, there will be more struggles ahead, but we will become stronger as we work through them. My fellow Bahamians, we are resilient and we are strong. This government has been focused on the urgent need to diversify the economy before the first COVID case was detected. The parliamentary caucus was tasked with coming up with ideas to diversify and stimulate the economy and produce more than 100 ideas. The Prime Minister established a link on the page of the Office of the Prime Minister for citizens to send in their ideas and the Economic Recovery Committee was established and tasked to deliver, quote, policy recommendations that will guide the government's strategy for recovery and the creation of an economy that is resilient, dynamic, inclusive, and sustainable. The Economic Recovery Committee is scheduled to come forward with its recommendations in the near future. We as a country are awaiting the revelation of their plans and vision for the new diversified and self-sufficient Bahamas. Dr. Darbell repeatedly refrained in his presentation where is your vision? Where is your creativity? We would ask that in as much as they have published a plan. I see no vision. I see no creativity. I see no plan for diversification. And we would posit the same to them. There is nothing wrong with consultation. We are trying to chart a course that we have never been on before. And we have to work collectively together to find the best way. So Winston Churchill said that an optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty. I would like us as a people, and despite the adversity, to embrace this time as an opportunity to reset our country in a manner which will make us more Mm self-sufficient. Through this adversity, let us begin to look at our country through different eyes. Let us search out those opportunities which are not dependent upon tourists and tourism. Let us welcome and encourage our citizens that live all over the world and provide great intellectual property to those countries to come home and to nurture and invest in us. And when they do, let us make room for them at the table because let us be honest, they left because there was no opportunity for them in their own country. And I've heard too often that when they tried to bring new ideas, they were often rejected or frustrated. Let us learn from them the skills and knowledge that they have acquired. Let us make it easy for them to do business at home. Let us take advantage of all of the opportunities provided to us in this budget, whether they be financing or education. Madam President, in wrapping up, I would just like it to be noted to clarify one more statement that would have been made by Senator Colby Davis. Inasmuch as she would have indicated that it was the PLP that brought Bahama to the shores of Nassau. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that is factually incorrect. What in fact happened was Perry Christie introduced the Bahama concept. That is true, undoubtedly so. However, the Bahama project was significantly modified from what was originally intended. Under the original conceptualization of it, there was even supposed to be a marina cut through, swirling around into the middle, which would have limited access to the beach. And that was significantly modified and changed. And it was under Hubert Alexander Ingram that the Bahama project was approved. Madam President, you may just wrap up for me, please. Yes, I have already thanked all of the medical professions on the front line of this crisis. I will not list them here as I've done so earlier. And I wish to end by thanking all grocery workers, sanitation workers, 
bankers, the Royal Bahamas Police Force, that's, 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 the Royal Bahamas Defense Force, Breezes Hotel, and all other essential personnel who have worked you so hard were, and placed themselves <laughs> at risk to serve this country and our people. I am pleased to stand behind and support this budget for our people. I have no reservations about it. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, just on a point of clarification, the Senator mentioned during her deliberation that, or she asserted that I was gloating um, the grief of persons that suffered during Hurricane, Hurricane Dorian. And I want to clarify on record that nothing about my contribution was a gloat of the grief anyone suffered. I spoke and I was pointing out the comment and the quote by the former Minister of Health was directly almost a mirror quote of what I said when I deliberated on the disaster authority and that is the only point where I was excited to see he said exactly the same thing I said. Not the grief that people suffered. I don't want to ever want anyone in this place to put words in my mouth and to try to ruin my character because that's not what I do when I am here on my feet. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Dean. Matter, that that was such a serious matter and that at any point during that, to take pleasure in what any member of parliament, upper or lower house, has to say on it is inappropriate. Thank you, um, Madam, Madam President. Um, I, yeah, I, I think um, I, I think that's been going around the table all day. Today, so, uh, but um, we certainly should we certainly should all um, um, stay away from that, uh, Madam President. Um, all. Um, Madam President, uh, I beg leave to move now that uh, the business of the Senate on its rising be suspended uh, for one hour until 3.30 uh, p.m. Jesus. No, uh, I class, I have my glasses on, 2.30. <laughs> to 2.30, yeah. Um, sorry. Yeah, to 2.30 p.m. Uh, today, the 25th day, 25th day of June 2020. If I may obtain a second. I step right second. Has been moved and seconded that the Senate be suspended until 2.30 p.m., yeah. right, um, at which time we will have lunch. As many as are in favor, yeah. aye. say aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The Senate is suspended until 2.30. All right.